So welcome everybody um, um, to the kernel dependability uh, microconference today. And we have um, several um, uh, people to thank uh, for sponsors, Facebook and um, IBM, Microsoft ARM um, Gold sponsors, and uh, Silver sponsors, AWS, Netflix, and Red, Red Hat. And the speaker gift sponsor is Calabra. Uh, and with that, um, we have a t-shirt sponsor, VMware. And then, of course, the uh, Linux Foundation for uh, providing the conference services and so on. And with that, we have an anti-harassment policy. Um, please abide by that when you are speaking uh, respectfully and talking um, and then uh, participating in discussions. Check your microphone, camera, when not actively participating. And we have a chat and we have shared notes. Participate in the chat, um, ask questions. Um, and the presentation start, uh, format is 15, 15 to 20 minutes of introduction to and then discussion on the topic. And thank you, the planning committee, for doing um, putting in all the hard work, making this possible. And let's see, I'm going to switch to the first presentation. That is um, um, Gab, you are going first, right? With your presentation. Yes, it's uh, myself and uh, Daniel. Okay. And I think I loaded that um, presentation. Let me see if I can bring that presentation in. So I am going to make you a presenter. Um, um, I can, I'll give you the present, take, you can take the present, uh, presenter ba back, um, uh, Gab, and I don't know if I have the right presentation for you, but you can load that. Okay, uh, great. So thank you very much, Shua. So let's see, yeah, I think, yeah, this is the right one. Okay, so yeah, thank you everybody for uh, joining the, the micro conference. Um, myself, I'm Gabriele Paloni, um, working at Red Hat as an open source technical leader, and I'm also working, uh, um, you know, in uh, the uh, Elisa project, and I'm leading uh, the architectural working group, um, and also. Um, our, uh, chairman uh, of the governing board. So today we will talk about, we, will, we want to talk about an idea, okay, that um, Daniel and myself had um, like some, some time ago. And um, so before we jump into the topic, maybe Daniel, you want to quickly introduce yourself. So hi, I'm Daniel. I also work for Red Hat. I work in the real time team, mostly working on upstream stuff and um, generally related to verification and real time and scheduling. Yeah, that's me. I'm not a leader on anything, just on code. Okay, good. Um, so let's start then. Okay, so this is uh, a redundant slide as we already talked about ourselves. <laughs> and uh, Right, so today we first, you know, uh, quickly summarize what is a zip decomposition. And uh, after doing that, we want to see if it is applicable uh, to uh, Linux driver subsystems, when it is worth applying it. And then the core of the discussion is how, okay? So how, how can we do that? And uh, there would be any penalty, so stay tuned, so let, let's start. Okay, so ACU decomposition is a, a, a pretty uh, straightforward methodology that is described in the ISO 26262. 
And what it says is that if you have a, a top level requirement that is assigned with a, um, an automotive safety integrity level, like uh, uh, ASIL-B, for example, you are able to decompose this requirement into um, redundant independent requirements of uh, different uh, uh, safety integrity level and you can uh, basically uh, and 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 you can uh, compose you know uh, this redundant requirement uh, in a way that the initial uh, top level requirement is is met okay now this description is not probably very clear but let's make an example okay a very quick one okay so we have uh, uh, a car display okay and the, the car display says okay so the use case is following a car failure the display system shall project the respective correct telltale within 100 milliseconds okay and this is uh, easily be okay so there is, there is a car failure a telltale must be projected and this must happen within 100 milliseconds okay this is the top level requirement okay now an example of decomposition is uh, we can say okay you know what uh, qualifying the, uh, the the main system with an ASIL-B it is uh, um, you know for, for ASIL-B it can be too expensive okay so what we do is we develop you know the display system with a, a qm of b safety integrity level and aside we put a safety monitor okay and the safety monitor is checking that every time there is a telltale request the telltale is displayed within the maximum time 100 millisecond and it also checks the telltale to be correct so effectively we decompose the you can see that we decompose the initial top level requirement into two different requirement. Uh, the first one is the same. However, we uh, downgraded the ASIL from ASIL B to QM of B. And then we added uh, an external monitor that now it is uh, you know, uh, assigned with ASIL B of B. Okay, so the sum between QM and ASIL B of B is ASIL B. And so this is the way we satisfy the, the initial top level requirement, okay? When it is worth doing this, it is worth doing this when the cost to develop and qualify the external safety monitor in this case is significantly lower than the cost of qualifying the, the main display system, for example, okay? Okay, so now, if we apply this concept to, to Linux, so this is a typical way of achieving this uh, decomposition on a, a Linux based for a Linux based system. Okay, in this example, you can see that we have the Linux kernel that is QM of B, and we have a QM of B application running on top. Then we have uh, underneath an ACLB hypervisor and an ACLB hardware. Aside, we have an ACLB safe OS and an ACLB of B application. Okay, indeed, you know the QM of B uh, element and the ACLB of B elements. These are uh, independent. Okay, the hypervisor is you know guaranteeing that they do not uh, interfere, and this is a pretty straightforward way of achieving the composition in Linux. Now, the problem with this approach is that. It is expensive, right? So the, the bill of material is significant. We need, uh, you know, like a hypervisor. We did uh, here. We have two operating systems, and then we have uh, two um, uh, two diverse and independent uh, application. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, it's uh, my question here. You know, what what is the cost behind this, right? And this is the idea. Okay. So the idea here is. So the the question is. Can we decompose? Uh, can we apply the composition within the kernel itself? Okay. So, and what does it mean in practice? Okay. So, in practice, it means that for a specific use case, okay, 
we identify the subsystems that are functionally required to support this use case and we get this subsystem monitored okay uh, so that if there is any failure in the monitored subsystem the monitor itself will will raise uh, an exception okay now there are behind this concept there are a lot of challenges right so first of all the monitor and the monitored element they must be um uh, uh they, they must be uh, diverse and uh, uh, independent okay so and one, one way to, one way to, to achieve this uh, for, for example how do we design uh, the monitor right so we so also yesterday in the referee track of uh, lpc so we introduced with daniel the runtime verification monitors okay so this is a way uh, to design a monitor of a specific subsystem for a specific functionality okay and uh, but then okay so even if we achieve the design of this monitor we can see that the monitor and the monitored element they are both running in, in the kernel in the same address space so how do we make sure that these two elements are independent okay so how you know is there how can I make sure that um, a failure in the kernel do not affect both elements you know in a in a, in a dangerous way okay so and, uh, and and effectively so I mean do, do we have some um, mechanisms to design the monitors especially the monitors in a way that they are less uh, subject to, to possible interferences right so and these are the, the you know the, the, the key question for for uh, you know for uh, for this um, discussion um, now is that a question or you is that the question you're asking here yeah, why my camera is like all unfocused mm -hmm. but um, so your question is can we separate address space from uh, like so it's like uh, what i'm saying is you have the monitor and the element running in the same address space which means that if something goes wrong with the element it could actually write over the monitor and kill the monitor as well i guess that's the problem you're having is that correct yes for example and uh and the and the, and the idea maybe it's not not so okay so now you said uh, like okay can we separate the address spaces right so but uh, um another uh, uh, you know the, we are trying to figure out if there is any possible mitigations like for example something that we thought uh, with daniel was okay maybe we can uh, so the, the the monitor itself has got like a, a, a sort of matrix of uh, states that uh, uh, must be monitored okay so may, maybe one way could be okay so the matrix of the states the, this that can be made read only for example right so um well you it's maybe, not just address space you have an issue with you also have um exceptions so basically if the kernel crashes won't it crash the monitor or i mean the element and the monitor so if the element yeah. triggers a triple fault it's going to take down the whole virtual machine that's a good one so exactly but, and, but, yeah. but 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 crashing the system is not that bad if uh, if crashing is an action that we would like to have if the the, the the things go wrong so basically oh you so if that's what you want, I mean, it depends. I don't know what the requirements are here. So, I mean, you yeah, could have the yeah. monitor say, like, you could have an external monitor saying the system just crashed. So basically, if it triple faults and kills everything, uh, it will kill the kernel. That will actually trigger, at least the hypervisor will detect that it was the triple fault. Mm -hmm. And then that can be passed in. So you could, so I'm assuming because Linux is actually a running as a guest on a special 
hypervisor that's has its own monitoring. You just have to make sure that the monitor still runs if the element dies, but if the kernel dies, it's fine. So either you protect the monitor by page table protection so that it does, it can't write to it. Like you said, set everything to read only inside the monitor. So any reads or writes will not affect it and hopefully it won't affect the tasks. I mean, yeah, to, to just to explain the monitor, what we have is the, the code itself of the monitor, one matrix of states, and one variable per element that we are monitoring. Mm -hmm. And this variable per element is read write. All the rest well, is read only. You could set, no, but the thing is, you could set it, if you want to play with games here, have that task, have that variable not actually read and writable from the kernel itself. It, you'd have to play with the memory management a little bit, but this is feasible. This is in theory possible. Is you have a maybe a kernel thread that has its own page table. Some uh, to uh, to read and write to this, it would take that and it will just get its own page table and then have access to it where none of the else of the kernel has any access to it. Question and and then the, you are the right person. What if this uh, the monitor is actually running? Hook it to an event that has interrupts disabled, like the sketch switch. Can we what do, do you that? Mean? Because the monitor it, it runs hooking by the event, for example. Yeah. Uh, and event one example, uh, let's get one is like sketch switch. If I want to create a monitor that monitors all the sketch switches, we have some restrictions of for running there, right? We are yeah. with the interrupts and preemption disabled. And one one of the features or one of the things that we're exploring with this kind of monitor is that it is synchronous to the execution. Uh, the monitor, it will only return to the execution after taking the processing the event or taking an action, for example, and then returning and then continuing the execution. Right. right. So so we have some restrictions of the things we can do. Uh you can also have the monitor, have it be, uh, this might be a trick, I don't know if this will work for you, but have it read only for everyone, including the monitor, even the variables. When you write to the variable, it takes a exception and have the update done in the exception handler by if it only is if it happened by the monitor. Okay, that could be a thing. Yeah. That could how, be how often do you update Just, the uh, state? I mean, is it every time you update the state, but you could take a, you know, Exception handler on that. Yeah, the the update will be it will depend on the thing that we will monitor, right? It, it depends on the frequency of the events. Uh it could be as high as um all the prints enable and disable, for example, which is mm -hmm. very frequently, or it can be less frequent, like sketch suites. It, it depends on the thing that we will monitor. So maybe for some monitors we will not require such such uh, uh um level of uh insurance. Uh, but, but yes, like for the, the watchdog monitor, we might require how frequent do we have, a we will have events on the watchdog monitor. Gabriel, you that know more than me. Well, well, the watchdog it's, uh, it, it depends. I mean, um, what we want to monitor, right? So here, um, I mean, for the watchdog, it's very critical to monitor that the timeout, it is set, uh, properly. Okay. So once the timeout is set, then the, the watchdog will, will, the safety watchdog will start. So if, you know, by any chance we, we miss to bet the watchdog, then the safe state will trigger, but that's fine. I mean, the customer would be very pissed off <laughs> if there was no hazard, but, uh, you know, like, um, it, no, it's no, not... I mean, I mean not, not how frequent the watchdog would, would happen, but how frequent the events that we are monitoring happen. And, and that, that, yeah, the, actually the question is how frequent is the update to the variables? I'm, unless it's yeah. every every time an event happens, do you update the variables? From the monitor side, likely, unless you are just spinning on an event that doesn't move from state. But generally it will change on, on every state change, it will write to that variable. Yeah, but this is a you know, this is a very good idea because anyway, yeah, yeah the, the the exception handler we need to qualify it according to ASLD somehow. So basically, we need to trust the kernel mechanism to to handle exception. Okay, so 
And effectively, if you're able uh, to update the, the variable using the exception under itself, it would sort of come for free, effectively, right? So uh, nice, nice doubt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, sorry, <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't see it properly. Um, so, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the one good thing about the monitor is that <clears throat> I didn't try to run all this software, the, the static code analysis, and try to see if this, uh, <clears throat> if the code is compatible with all the rules, like the code, the 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 data only goes no the the, the code only goes forward. Uh, the memory is always statically allocated. I'm designing it for it. I don't have a dynamic allocation while the monitor is running. Uh, the code only goes forward. So we will likely have a, a, a good life with all these other things we need to check. And it, it would be good to have a list of things that I would have to to, to do to, to, to have the monitors in the way that, that guarantees like the, 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 the quality of the code. But the, the challenge seems to be more on these on writing these state variables. Being attacked. <laughs> She's like, pay attention to me. Um, no, I mean, actually, well, the the fall handlers are rather simple. Or simple. I mean, they have to be. Uh, so to verify the fault handling. I mean, but then again, you take a page fault, then you have to verify the hardware. I don't know how much you need in the hardware verification to make sure everything's fine there. Because that's an updating on page fault. I don't know, like I said, performance wise, you need a stack, you know, it will save the stack, everything else. Another, I don't know if there's any other way to save something in a special register or not, but then again, registers could always be trampled over. So it's hard to maintain state. Um, that's not. Um, so basically the monitor is just event driven. It's not, it's the monitor I'm assuming is not a thread or not a process. It's just a, it's just something that's attached to the event. So when events happens, it triggers the monitor and then it works there. Yeah. So to change, so that means any, there's no con, there's no one context that you could have. And the other thing is if there is, if the element is a thread or whatnot, you could at least keep the element itself from touching the monitors. That's another option. So when you schedule in the, the element process, if it's a process or whatever it is, it's context, you could keep it from touching anything. One thing that we need to be careful here is, um, so you say, Daniel, so the, the, the monitor is event driven, right? So now we talked about the, uh, special interference. So we just we just said okay. Now we we, we, are, we talked about okay. You know, this way we can protect the address space. You know of the of the monitor. How how to make sure that the monitor is alive? So how to protect the monitor against uh, time interference? Okay. So and uh, and this is. I think this is something that we need to think about because correct me if I'm wrong, but if the monitor is event driven, so it's not a threat, the monitor itself is not able to pet, you know, uh, an external watchdog regularly to say, hey, I'm, I'm alive, I'm alive, I'm alive, I'm alive, right? You you might need something to, to excite the monitor. Ah, yeah. Okay, so basically you can have a thread to trigger the monitor. To make a sure thread that... that generates an event, and this could be like even a, a um, let's say, a thread that pings the watchdog. If it generates an event in the monitor, we will be, will be, 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 we could send an event. We could have a reaction specific for an event. This event always hit a reaction, and this reaction is always pinging the the watchdog. That 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 that's something it's easy to. Mm. Yeah. So.
so you seem to have two uh, issues, right? One is uh, keep is the monitor running, testing the status of the monitor, some kind of keep alive, and then also how do you isolate the monitor from your watchdog itself? There is an isolation um, problem that you're looking at, and then also how passive or active the monitor should be in terms of interfering with the rest of the system. And the third issue is, do you know if the monitor is even running? Is that is that kind of summarizes at a higher level? Yeah, so so, so the, the monitor itself, we kind of trust it uh, in terms of, uh, so we are not worried about uh, possible interference from the monitor toward the rest of the uh, kernel because the monitor itself is qualified uh, according to ASIL B. So there will be a sort of, uh, you know, it, it should be developed according to, just the monitor should be developed according to the ISO 26262 um, requirements. So you have a high degree of confidence that is a good guy. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, let's do it. Right, that, 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 that I get, but I mean, from the safety perspective, but I mean, the interference on the system, how passive is the monitor itself? Meaning when it's updating um, variables or how, how much of the system is it impacting? Whether it's safe or unsafe, that's slightly different aspect, right? The, the monitor is pretty much isolated. It doesn't depend on anything. It, it's self-contained, of course. So, and it, and it doesn't run like with a thread or, or anything. It runs in the same context of the current context. If it's an, area, an event that's happening inside an area queue, it runs inside the area queue as code of the area queue. Uh, if it's in a thread, it runs synchronously with, with the thread as if it was kept the, the thread code. And, and uh, it's self-contained. It, it might leave its self-code calling a function outside of its context if there is a reaction that it would cause. For example, if uh, I am receiving only events that I need, I, I recognize, it might just stay on its own context. Uh, reading values from that matrix, writing on that variable that we mentioned, and running running on its own code. And currently the, the zone code is all uh, inside the same function. Uh, when I have a reaction, I might call code external of the mo from the monitor. And then an exception could be call panic. An exception could be write to the trace buffer. But it's all under control. Yeah. So the, the only, I mean, the only possible issue that I can see is that if we have, uh, let's say, I mean, we have a top level safety application here, right? So now the, the timeout set is not. Uh, a proper example, okay, but let's imagine that we have a, a sort of, a, I don't know, autonomous driving application, so something more complex, okay, that comes with, uh, also with critical timing requirements, okay, so the, the, the only issue that, uh, you know, I could be worried about is, now, if we have the monitors alive running in the kernel, are we still able, you know, to, to meet the, the FTTI deadlines, right? So the, the safety critical deadlines for the safety for the safety function itself running on top, right? Um, yeah. So this is uh, maybe you know one aspect. You're that, concerning. So, you mean? Let, let's see if I get. You're concerning about the overhead that the monitor would imply in the application, right? Yes. Yeah, it, it depends on the, it will depend mostly on the granularity of the events that we want to monitor, right? Uh, I could, I can run this monitor with uh, events like that run very frequently, like in preemption, disable and enable inside the kernel, trying to force it. It doesn't, uh, it runs and system goes slower, but it's unlikely to think that we will monitor at such a granularity. So the fact that system stays stable, even monitoring on tests, very high frequency events, it's a good sign. Uh, but yes, we will need to take care of the, uh, the granularity that we aim the monitoring. 
right? And it should be measurable. The I'm assuming that yeah. the monitor is O1. Uh, it doesn't have yeah. a variable. So all time the monitor the monitor has a max time that it will take to or every yeah. event it goes off. You have a constant time, ma constant max. So and since it's triggered by events, you can look at the events that are caused or in the path of the element and trigger say, okay, in this time frame we have X number of events. Take the X number, times it by the time, and then look at the rest of it. Does this is this going to affect our deadline? Yeah. Yeah. Just 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 to have an idea of granularity of the overhead of the monitor. In the experiments I did in the past, it was faster to run the monitor then writing the information it was tracing to the trace buffer. So that, that's information that Stephen can, can have a nice idea of granularity. We, we just need to figure out how much overhead we will have with this idea of, uh, of uh, a change in the state on a, inside a trap. Yeah, that might, be, that might be an issue. That's the only thing I worry about because that could cause, that causes synchronization issues. So it does a lot of things in the hardware that will uh, slow things down. Yeah. And still, we, we have a good starting point. The starting point is promising. And, and that's why I said maybe if if it's possible to uh, keep the element or whatever you want from writing to it, or do you have to worry about the rest of the kernel modifying or mod um, rest of the kernel corrupting the monitor? Is that the issue you also have to protect? In other words, do you have to make sure that this variable in the monitor cannot be corrupted by anything else going on in the kernel outside the element? Yeah. Mm, yes. But this is why we say try to, to update the variables using the exception handler, right? Yeah. Okay. So I think this is, I mean, this was a very good feedback and I mean, it gave us, you know, quite very good, I mean, very good ideas. Now, I think now the key question now is, is it worth doing it? So if you remember uh, the initial slide that I presented uh, about the decomposition, right? So we said, okay, so we have, uh, what is it? So let's see if I can bring it back, this one. So here we have, on the top, we have like, uh, a pretty complex uh, system, right? With the with the you know with this uh, complex MCU complex operating system, doing you know uh, the, the the displaying of telltale. And the reason why here it is worth to decompose it's because here the monitor is much simpler. Okay, so here what the monitor does, it uh, basically treat backs the the display uh, buffer. It generate, uh, it calculate a CRC, and it compare the, the CRC against uh, a predefined lookup table according to telltale that that is requested, right? So it's it's really a, a pretty simple design. And uh, now, when it comes to now, let's going back to the context of uh, Linux monitors, right? So here. We already discussed about uh, isolation. Okay, so here we are. I mean, we are building a, a confidence that you know these monitors can be, you know, pretty much isolated. Now the key question is, what is the effort of qualifying uh, the monitors, or of developing the monitors in this case because they are not there yet. Um, compared to the effort of uh, qualifying um, Linux uh, for a specific uh, functionality. And I mean, my personal opinion is that the, I mean, the challenge with qualifying Linux for a specific functionality is that, you know, the, we have, active kernel code that is usually not only focusing, that is not only reacting to that functionality, really. So, but what's happening is that we are having, uh, you know, interaction 
with the, all the other subsystems, VFS, Watch, that we can interact with all the other subsystem according to different many stimuluses, right? So instead, if you look at these monitors, this can be, you know, only designed, you know, to, to, to make sure that when there is an, a certain stimulus, the, the reaction is, is the, you know, the, the, is the expected one. So in my view, I mean, I have the feeling that yes, it is worth because it, you know, the, 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 at the end, the, the model of the monitor only focuses on a specific functionality and, uh, uh, you know, the, the level of complexity is only bound, you know, by, by the, the functionality that, that you're looking at, right? So, uh, you know, this is my, my line of thinking, um, to be honest. Now, I don't know what, what is your view, you know, about this point. Um, let, let, let's exercise one thing. The good thing about having the monitors in software and part of Linux is that it's reusable for the, all the people that would like to use Linux on safety critical system. Different of an external monitor yeah. that might be used one by one vendor, by another vendor, by another vendor. And uh, the feedback that the, the software monitor gives to the Linux. Okay, there is this case here that's actually monitoring an active system, right? But there is also another aspect, which is using this for testing. Having it in software inside Linux gives more uh, evidences for testing Linux. Yes. As a, put one point, right? Other points, I, other points, please. Audience. I haven't been in the field long enough for, I mean, for playing with the uh, automotive side of things and understand exactly what's going on. So I, I agree that I agree that the, it, if it's part of the Linux, then it would be easier for um, uh, monitoring. I mean, uh, external keeping the monitors keep. We have to keep changing the monitors. Of course, they have to evolve, right? So it would be good to be part of it. However, I do think that isolation and overhead need to be really controlled. Depending on uh, you're mentioning, Gavin that yeah. um, the uh, how responsive how much all of those things that would be the real critical issue or how do you isolate it from the rest of the system and how would you keep the overhead low enough that it is not impacting the critical aspects of any uh, safety critical system so is uh, example i keep saying this example um, that if you have a um, if the monitor infotainment versus actual critical operation. So it has to go forward, right? It, that's where the isolation comes in. When a monitor goes down, obviously you don't want to take the critical systems down. So you have to keep that isolation um, and overhead down. That's, that's kind of my thinking. The, another thing that hasn't been brought up, by the way, um, I, also, have you thought this could also be used possibly for security systems? I mean, for security, uh, instead of just for monitoring that the hardware or something's working, but actually monitoring that the operating system is doing what you expect it to be doing. Uh, and ha if you have a bunch of states that you could define when my, uh, when my system allows these states normal, if something happened where someone tried uh, doing an attack on the system, it changes the states, the, could that possibly cause um, an issue of some kind so that it could be detected through a monitor. I mean, it's yeah. not just safety critical. Yeah, the, the monitor has, has many benefits and usage, right? The, the things that are there now in, in the first RFC of the RV, they, the code is self-contained already. It just, it is O of one for each event. And uh, so, and, and the, it seems to be faster than tracing which would be the evidence that would could use for, 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 for understanding the system, right? So the starting point seems to be good and useful for a vast majority of cases, but not the ASOB that we need to, to understand. One question is how many monitors do we think we need on, um, 
on a system? Uh, that is uh, dependent on the use case. <laughs> so, um, I mean, uh, I don't know, because I mean, if 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 I think about you now the, the the telltale use case that we are working on uh, in Elisa, right? So, there are two two main functionality that are really safety critical. So, the first one is setting the watchdog timeout that we just mentioned. The second one is making sure that the safety application itself is able to take uh, uh, the right decision. So the safety application is reading uh, uh, a message coming uh, from an external hardware, is, is unpacking the message, checking uh, if the message was not corrupted, and is also reading the message say, oh, okay, everything is fine. So I, I pet the wash. So, now this means we need to you know guarantee the integrity of the uh, process address space we need to, you know um, if there is a memory map involved now i cannot remember but basically we need to guarantee that you know that uh, the, 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 that basically we, we don't have interferences between processes so that the memory subsystem work okay so another question is, okay, then how do we qualify the memory subsystem, for example? So do, do we need, you know, to output monitors there as well? So this is, a, you know, uh, something that we really need to look into. And uh, I don't have an answer uh, right now. No. Yeah, but wrapping up, I, I think from, from my side, I, I have uh, an idea of where to go. So I'm trying to make monitors safer for the application. And, and that's, that's part of the code that I'm, I'm sending actually to be part of the tracing subsystem. So Steven is aware. So from the coding, coding side, I think the, the people involved have an idea of where to go. That's, that's a good, um, good outcome of this discussion. Right? Any last minute comment, uh, question? Uh, don't be shy. Okay, one minute. Okay, so tell you what. So the next step in my view is uh, let's try to, you know, to design a watchdog monitor and, uh, you know, try to push it upstream and let's see what, what the feedbacks yeah. are. Okay, design so the monitor. Something. Yeah, it will be design the monitor try it as is with the monitoring now. I will soon send the version two of the, the RV interface. And then with, with that, I can, with the version two, I can ping Steven and, and get some ideas on the trapping part of the code and how we can change that. And this thing will be warm in the code as well because he will have to review it. Anyway, so, good, good. We know where to go. And then, and then Rob is doing benchmark and, and collecting more data. Okay, so thank you very much, everybody. Time is up and uh, it's time uh, uh, for the next session. Um, that is uh, Rachel, right? Uh, is it correct? Um, yes. Yes, yes. Yeah, let's, uh, so Rachel, I'm gonna make you presenter. <clears throat> so please select the, I'm, I'm gonna hide myself. And uh, yeah, please select the, the right, uh, great. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, okay, so, a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Rachel Sibley. Um, I'm a, a quality engineer working at Red Hat. Uh, I, I've been with the company for about seven years. Uh, actually, next Wednesday is my anniversary. Uh, I'm currently working as the QE technical lead for the new automotive initiative at Red Hat. Uh, previously, I worked in kernel QE team embedded in CKI as the test lead with a focus on coordinating test coverage for the kernel. 
So here's the agenda of what I wanted to cover. Um, it's the main focus that I, I really wanted to, to touch on today was the importance of traceability and code coverage techniques, which is important to functional safety systems, which in turn is important to automotive, the automotive industry, of course. So uh, just to give some background, uh, we can talk a little bit about what the Automotive Initiative is and, um, and CKI and Kernel CI and, and how we'd like to uh, leverage what, what features they have in place. So for the automotive industry, um, I'm sorry, the Automotive um, um, Initiative here at Red Hat, it's, uh, this is a new initiative that Red Hat is uh, in, embarking on. They want to join the automotive space and they would like to deliver the first certified Linux operating system for road vehicles. So it's, it's going to be heavily based on RHEL. Um, so we're going to want to reuse and leverage RHEL's existing testing uh, development practices for automotive. Um, and there's going to be new areas to explore like infotainment and functional safety. Uh, functional safety is going to be one of those big areas, of course. Uh, Requirements are going to be closely tied to the certification process as they're identified. So this is going to happen during uh, brainstorming sessions that we've already been starting up um, as we identify potential hazards and review our existing processes for gaps. So I just mentioned we'll be reusing the development and testing practices we have for RHEL. Uh, this includes the use of CKI's features, including both code coverage analysis and targeted testing. So for those who aren't familiar, CKI is uh, Red Hat's public facing CI service, uh, responsible for testing and gating downstream kernels, in addition to providing testing and feedback for the upstream kernel trees. Um, CKI is part of the kernel CI upstream project and a member of the Linux Foundation, along with other public facing CI systems where they're working together to aggregate the reporting using KCIDB, kernel CI database. There was a talk given by Nikolai Kondrashov, uh, I believe it was yesterday. So uh, if you're in, unable to attend, definitely check out the recording later for details. If you'd like to find out more. So, the ISO 26262 <laughs> specification is a standard for functional safety and road vehicles. And it includes a statement on the importance of code coverage and traceability to software requirements. Code coverage becomes increasingly important according to the ASL level. The ASL level refers to the automotive safety level, um, the automotive safety integrity level, and that's, that can be used to classify risks. So by using code coverage, it enables us to provide the evidence and traceability that our testing is either sufficient or we have gaps in our testing which need to be corrected. So what we have today is still being worked on. Um, but right now uh, with, with CKI, it, it fetches a pre-built GCOV kernel for RHEL versus building the GCOV kernel directly in the pipeline. Um, you can trigger code coverage analysis by calling a bot on a related merge request for onboarding a new test. Uh, also Red Hat's kernel development recently moved to GitLab, so the, where the patches are submitted and tested and then feedback is linked directly back to the merge request level. So here is another place we can also trigger code coverage analysis by modifying a config file. So there is work on going to enable code coverage um, analysis in the RHEL pipeline where the GCUB kernels are built in CI. And eventually this could be extended to all support option kernels. Currently it's, dis it's disabled temporarily while the team works on forwarding it to work with the new provisioner, UPT. Uh, but work has already taken place to open source the wrapper tests which use LCUB. Um, LCOV is a graphical front end um, to that uh, front end to GCOV, which is uh, used to generate the HTML reports. Code coverage can also be useful to identify gaps at the subsystem level. 
For example, we can filter down using the KDIR parameter to provide a more granulated report by focusing on a specific directory or a list of directories in the kernel source and then run tests that relate to that subsystem. We also have the option to combine multiple reports and tests into a combined HTML report, which is nice to have if the test, test runs are, are triggered at different times or they're run on different hosts. Both merging and report generation are now handled directly in the, the pipeline. So here's an example, um, hopefully you can see it. <laughs> um, it's, it, this is being run on XFS tests. And here we're narrowing down on the FS XFS directory in the kernel source using the KDIR parameter. Uh, by default, it automatically pulls in uh, related libraries. Uh, but you can see from, you can see here in the report, it actually doesn't look so bad from the coverage perspective. 74% uh, is seems pretty good. Uh, of course, you'll see a big difference in coverage if we were to run this against the entire kernel. So it is, it's nice to be able to drill down when needed. So another method for uh, measuring code coverage, traceability, um, in, and linking them back to test requirements and features. This is uh, something called targeted tested that, that CKI has. Um, so to provide an overview, it's a, it's a tool called KPET, Kernel Patch Evaluated Testing, and it can be used to evaluate each patch under test and automatically run matching tests which relate to the changes introduced in the patch. It uses regex patterns, which relate to each test found in the KPET database. And then it will trigger automatically as patches are tested in CI. And this is based on changed file or directory names. So it can also be used for running a subset of tests, which relate to an upstream, upstream kernel subsystem. Um, since right now we're not testing upstream kernel patches yet because of concern security concerns, but it's uh, being worked on. Um, so for example, you can run all the networking tests for the NetNext tree, as an example. The tests are categorized um, by different types that relate to subsystem level. Uh, KPET is a framework in the CLI, and whereas KPET DB is the database which defines the condition for each test case. So you can take a look at the bottom. There are some examples of, of how to preview related tests um, for a specific patch or how you would invoke the CLI to generate the XML, which is the input that we use for the restraint harness, which is used with the UPT provisioner. So possible improvements. Um, we, we mentioned, I mentioned earlier about the uh, targeted tests and right now it's purely informational. CKI has an, a nice dashboard called Data Warehouse where you can take a look at every single result and then see whether or not uh, targeted tests were run on, on the kernel builds or patches. And it's informational now, but what, what they'd like to do is actually gate on merge requests going forward where if a meaningful test isn't run on a specific change, then that change is going to be blocked from being merged until a test is onboarded that would actually run and, and target what's under test. So that is a feature that I know CKI is looking into and they are targeting maybe spring of next year. Um, and then the other part would be about actually having code coverage analysis run automatically in the pipeline, which is, as I mentioned, that part is almost done, at least for RHEL kernels. Um, there's some finishing touches about, uh, they were dealing with artifact limit, the si artifact size limitations, but I think that's mostly covered and still working on some other parts to get that um, completed. But having that run automatically um, at, a, at a regular cadence where the reports are stored somewhere where you can review them and um, determine where the gaps are. 
so I, I have some questions that I wrote down, but of course I open to any questions uh, besides what's listed on the slide. Um, but some of the questions I have so far is I'm interested to hear if, any, if anyone else in the room has actually used co code coverage analysis and do you find it useful? Uh, is 90% coverage, is that realistic? <laughs> Have you have you seen numbers that high, especially for testing code coverage on the entire kernel, or it's more of a, at a granulated level where you're specifically drilling down on uh, a subsystem level? Um, how how often are you actually running it and, and generating the reports? Um, building are you doing it at a patch level? Are you doing it testing baselines periodically? How are you actually doing it? I, I know be, building GCUP kernels can be not only time consuming, but expensive. Um, if you're not running it for every patch, then how do you know that coverage is good enough? What, what other techniques are you using for, for code coverage besides something like targeted testing or code coverage analysis? Um, code coverage is, uh, as a verification measure, it's expected to track um track the software requirements all the way down to the design so what else are we missing in linux um so yeah open open to hearing suggestions or hearing what what people are currently using now for for code coverage and traceability there are um, a couple of uh comments in the chat rachel uh, sorry brennan go ahead oh, oh, oh no worries uh we can go over the chat questions first um yeah so i'm just taking a look syscaller uses k cub okay um yeah can you can you talk about that a little bit more how are you using it um is it something that's run run on a regular basis is it is it useful to you okay so I, I see there's a link to the code coverage reports i can take a look at those thank you for sharing those okay coverage reports are very useful for assessing how good the testing is what's missing basically the only way to ensure that basically basically the only way to ensure that's what the developer thinks is covered is really covered agreed okay i really like the idea of gating patches with missing targeted tests currently we are doing this manually are you planning to automate this yes yeah, so right now it it's automated in a way where we're showing the showing whether or not patches are including targeted tests or, or meaningful tests that are run. Uh, that's what KPET's used for. So right now it's informational, but uh, CKI wants to actually have it where it's run automatically in the pipeline, where it will block any merge requests from being merged. So. Um, that's that not only with tests failing, but in addition, if there's no targeted test or meaningful test running on that change and that change, it's going to be blocked. So I know that's a planned feature for CKI. Uh, yeah, and Veronica already answered that. Thank you. Um, hey, important stuff. Also interested in getting a sense of what Code, code is covered by customer workloads. GCUB has performance impacts that make it inappropriate for customer deploy kernels. Yeah, one of the things that I noticed with code coverage um, when we were play, playing around with it when I was on the CKI team, when you're running it with a, a large number of tests, you know, kernel tests are inherently known as to be flaky. So if one test in the middle of that run fails or causes the system to crash or maybe it finds a real bug the rest of the tests don't they don't get run because the system resets or um there's a timeout a watchdog timeout or whatnot so uh sometimes it can be difficult when you're trying to 
run the re generate the reports and and get that get the feedback there if if one test misbehaves so that's i know that's one of the the issues that we had run into um, lots of the code in the arc uh, arm 64 that's part of what the most i'm familiar with is gated on hardware feature support often for hardware which doesn't exist yet it'll be interested I'll, i'd be interested to and how we get more coverage in that without having to run AG and emulation. Yeah. So if you are if you are interested in what CKI is doing with code coverage analysis, um, and in turn that's something that I know we really want to leverage for automotive, you can you can take a look at the um, the um, the test. The links aren't uh, clickable here, of course, but if you download the slides, all the links are there on the slides. So you can take a look at the tasks that we have for our code coverage. Um, that's in the upstream kernel test uh, repo that CKI uses. So definitely take a look at that. Or of course, you can contact me or, or email the CKI project mailing list for more details. And Brendan, sorry to cut you off. I was going through the comments in the chat. So uh, no worries. Uh yeah, so I, I guess there, there's a lot of different things here. Um, so I, I think, I, I, you know, I think I, I, I wasn't aware that anyone was this far along with uh, using coverage for anything in any public projects. So I think this is awesome. Um, so looking at a lot of different parts of the kernel, I think we're a pretty far away, far ways away from making gating patches. Uh, uh, on coverage, a reasonable thing to do. Um, I, 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 I think it's just w with with coverage being low, it's. I don't think it's really realistic to ask a lot of developers to do that right now. I think, um, but I, I think it, it's a good ultimate goal to achieve. Um, I, I would I would really like to see. Uh, I, I think it would be great if if that's that's a place we could get to eventually. But I, I think, uh, Kate, did, were you saying something? Yeah, so I'll finish your th finish your thoughts, and then I've got a couple of questions for, for you. Um, but I, I think that um, uh, if we could get, I think the real thing we needed we get need to get here right is um, maintainer buy-in. I think uh, maintainers are how we're going to push these things. I don't I don't know that having like a feature in CKI is really like the right way to go about this. I think what we need to do is make it clear and evident for maintainers so that way they can make decisions on it. Um, I was gonna I was gonna mention some of the other things, but before we change topics, uh, okay. Kate, then I'll, I'll, then I'll then. So one of the things I'm sort of curious about is uh, what is a reasonable threshold uh, before we turn this type of thing on in your mind. By default for each patch. Um, well, how much coverage do we need to be seeing? Well, I, I, so I think that's that's kind of another another issue is I, I don't I don't believe that there's like a real there's a correct okay. <clears throat> coverage target to achieve. Um, like for example, I think ninety percent coverage is probably um, a little in, in most projects. So I, I've uh, my original background, I, I worked on um, user space software, and I worked on a number of different projects. And I think the only code base that I ever saw that had any had like about ninety percent code coverage, they kind of gamed the system. Uh, they they provided coverage for like generated code and stuff, which mm -hmm. was not useful. And I, I d don't get me wrong. I love coverage. Um, one of the things that's that's that was really cool on one of the projects that I did that I thought was did it real in a really healthy way is coverage reports were automatically uploaded to pre-submits, and you could then click on your code and it would show you incremental coverage, and you'd go, oh, the incremental coverage on like this particular change is kind of low. You could click and. And you basically could use it to help inform like what you should be testing and stuff. 
but we never but on that project we never set any hard coverage numbers it was just mm -hmm. sort of left up to um the developers on the team to kind of they developed a sense for what healthy coverage looked like and i think it was more about looking at the coverage reports um drilling all the way down to individual files rather than looking at like what the the overall combined coverage percentage was um so that that being said mm -hmm. i i've seen that most code bases it seems like getting between 70 and 80 percent is achievable um but i i don't i don't know that i would use that for anything more than a rule of thumb yeah no it's just a, i'm just wondering it sounds like you know, can we look at tackling it, you know, subsystem by subsystem with maintainers by and basically engaging with the maintainers and to tackle it by um, getting some of the subsystems such that that becomes a policy and no subsystems that some of this stuff is turned on. Yeah. Is that a way to approach it? Yeah, I, I, um, I think that's the way we'd have to approach it. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think it would be awesome if we could do that. Okay. Well, I'm just thinking that, you know, there's some parts that have been done like Daniel's been doing the work on the formal verification already, for instance. And so some of those pieces might be close or than others. Uh, so which top. Daniel? Um, Oliveira. <laughs> Daniel B. Uh, me? Brisa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, co co code coverage is, is important because the RFV, it doesn't try to create a model of all the states of the system that the system can reach. We, we model the events that uh, we expected from the system and we need some kind of exercise in the system to try to exercise all the possible uh, paths that it can take. So in, this, in this case, the coverage is important to see if we covered all, all, the, all the paths that we expect on the system. Uh, one thing I wanted to point out was the, we, we talked about uh, gating, uh, gating the the changes on on targeted tests it wasn't for code coverage analysis code coverage analysis and targeted tests those are two distinct things um, they're both working towards code coverage um, but what cki was looking to to gate on was targeted tests so that was about triggering meaningful tests based on the changed sources looking at the different looking at the files and the directories that are changed in the patch and then running tests that, that relate to those changes based in the KPET database. So that's, that's what they were looking at, not running, you know, running GCOV um, code coverage analysis and generating reports and looking to see how many lines are covered and crossing a specific threshold. But I, I think, you know what, for automotive, it would be useful just to looking, looking at it at a subsystem level and you know periodically running tests and making sure that we're we're not only using it but we're seeing a positive trend so i think that's what what would be important i don't know about 90 100 percent of the entire kernel i think that's going that's not going to be achievable or realistic but breaking it down by subsystem level and and making sure that we are seeing a, a positive trend as we're running the reports and improving improving our test coverage is, is something that would be valuable for, for automotive and the kernel in general. <laughs> there is a comment oh, I want to... Oh. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah there, there's a comment um, I want to make. And um, so I think, and Daniel, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, <clears throat> so there, there is, a, there can be like a, a very, um, a very strong relationship between the runtime verification monitors and the, and the code coverage reports. I mean, not only the code coverage is, you know, is a way to, to verify that uh, all the monitors, all the, sorry, all the monitor states uh, have been uh, stimulated and reached. But on, on the other side, it's also the other way around. So basically, once we have a model for a certain subsystem, we are also able uh, to explain why certain code coverage cannot be achieved. And uh, I saw, for example, that, uh, that there was a um, Will Deacon that made a comment about, uh, you know, uh, hardware feature support, right? So 
um, so how, how we can get, you know, like, uh, uh, um, more, I mean, how can we increase the coverage? Effectively, once we have uh, a, a model for the subsystem, then we are also able to, to know what are, you know, the, the states that, you know, that we are missing to, to stimulate. And by looking at the model, we should be able also to identify what are the inputs that would allow to, to you know, to, um, to reach these states. Is it? Yeah, actually, RV depends on, on trying to cover out possible states from the, from, from, from the user space or from the, the users of the system. And knowing that we exercise the system is a good evidence that we exercise the model. Now, I, unfortunately, um, Mark Lover is not here anymore. He was at the, big, at the previous session. And there was even uh, some discussions about using the RV to monitor uh, which, which paths inside the, the monitor it was taken by covering, covering the, the, the code of the monitor to see how, how the system impacts in the monitor. Mark, Mark Lover would have something to add here. Unfortunately, he, he probably is in another, another topic. But these things are, 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 are correlated by definition, or RV at least, it's necessary. Hey, we sort of diverged and Brendan, we, you had some other thoughts you wanted to bring in. <laughs> so do you want to continue? Or we went into that direction. Um, yeah, I, there, uh, I don't know, like, so, so, uh, you know, I, I guess somewhat fortunately and somewhat unfortunately, um, I'm giving a talk later today with Shua and uh, I think you covered a lot of the areas that I was planning on covering, but that's okay. I mean, I think <laughs> <laughs> it, it's also good because it shows it's, it's an important topic and that people are, are you know, mm -hmm. talking about it and thinking about it, which is the, really the, the reason we're, we're here. Um, so, the, uh, I, I, I think the, yeah, I, I think probably the most, the most uh, important thing we could do here is like come up with a strategy for uh, how do we share with maintainers what their coverage looks like and in, in an actionable way, but is also not noisy. Um, and I think one of the things that kind of ties into that is your question about uh, generating the reports being expensive. Um, so I think generating the ports are, it, it tends to be expensive when running the tests are expensive. When running your tests is cheap, then getting the coverage is also comparatively cheap. Um, so I, I, I'm speaking from experience here. Uh, I, I'm the the Knet maintainer, and you know, shamelessly plug, like shameless plug, Knet tests are pretty cheap to run, and uh, we we can generate reports for them where it's feasible to generate a report for like every uh, every change that's submitted. So like right now we run um, uh, most of the Knet tests, or actually I think it's only about a third. We, we, we want, run a pretty large uh, large proportion of our Knet tests on uh, every change submitted to the K-self test list. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I guess like the, you know, most of the coverage we have right now is is not via K unit and I, that's not something that's going to happen in any kind of near term but I, I guess the point is cheap tests are one way to make the per change coverage achievable um well, one of the things that's are. occurring to me here is as mm -hmm. part of you know making the your, to your completely agree with your points no argument about mm -hmm. that but one of these features i'm seeing is missing is the requirements uh, associated with a unit or a subsystem. Mm -hmm. And so I'm sort of thinking that um, having the requirements document along with the coverage and keeping that type of information together will become more useful, make the, everything more useful. So possibly as people are you know, trying to figure out how we can start to make this practical uh, to share with the stuff with the maintainers is also you know, keeping a documented set of what the requirements are that are triggering 
the tests and so forth. So like the higher level requirements that are being aimed for. And quite frankly, so that if the maintainers are disagreeing with it or they're changing their minds on things, we have a way of tracking that too. Hmm. But things evolve, right? They evolve well, by patches and then the patches are done by a reason and what was the reason and that's the requirement. Right, well, I think probably the best way in my opinion i don't know you you probably have more experience with like uh relating tests uh to requirements but i think ideally if you can phrase the requirement in the language of the test then the requirement if the requirement ever changes then the test automatically changes it's kind of like coverage versus code yeah or sorry uh comments versus code like it you know comments become stale but i think similarly coverage becomes stale or uh requirements become stale when they're not somehow directly tied to a test or someone's very actively maintaining them yeah rachel do you have any thoughts there yeah no that's i mean that's the whole point is we want to be able to track the traceability all the way down from the requirements all the way down to um code coverage and to make sure that we are you know, have that traceability. And with that's one of the things that KPET was trying to aim for with the targeted testing. So features come in as merge requests. They're filed first, you know, with Red Hat, they're filed first with Mozilla, and then we have them, you know, in the form of a merge request. And then the targeted test is run to specifically test that change. But in addition, it'd be nice to actually see the code coverage on that you know, as a result of that test running on that requirement, having that traceability all the way down to the coverage level. So yeah, those are things that are being worked on. Um, but yeah, one of the kind of goes back to the, the primary thought about having that it's expensive <laughs> to run code coverage analysis on a patch level basis. But thank you, everybody. This has been a really good discussion. Um, and I'll, I'll definitely check out some of the links that were in the chat. I appreciate all the, the great feedback uh, about code cover. It sounds like everybody's on the same page that it's, it's an important part of uh, kernel development. Thank you, Rachel. That's great. Thanks for sharing. Uh, what you do at the CKI and it's uh, interesting to know how you are selecting. Also, if you have information on how you're selecting, um, determine which test to run, that might be useful to learn also for all of us. Yeah, yes. that's linked in the slides. Um, okay. If you're to download the slides on KPET DB source code. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so next uh, session is uh, David uh, Malcolm, Adic, okay, kernel specific test coverage to GCC. Um, hi, David. I'm going to make you a presenter. Uh, mm -hmm. Right. Cool. There you are. Okay, so we are ready uh, when you are. <laughs> is there a, uh, let me switch the uh, slides, or do I have to do that? Uh, hold on, to, um, there we go, I think. And, um, okay, um, I'll, I'll go for it then. Um, hello everybody, um, uh, my name's David Malcolm, and I work at Red Hat on the, on our tool, platform tools team. So I work on, for the last um, eight years now, I've been working on GCC, mostly working on um, usability improvements. So basically um, improvements to how our, our, our warnings and errors look, um, things like fix it hints, spelling mistakes, um, correcting spelling mistakes and so on. In the last uh, couple of years, I've been working on a, this uh, Dash F analyzer, which is a static analysis um, option. Uh, attempt to do static analysis um, inside the compiler so you can find more problems at compile time. Um, this talk is, or, or this session, or at least my slides, um, there's a there's sort of a condensed version of a talk I gave in the GNU track, which is more focused on the GCC 
um, side of things. So I guess I want to, um, let's create a, um, did a poll, did you attend my Monday uh, talk? And response true, false, um, and hopefully, did that show up? I don't know. Do people, hopefully people see the poll? Yeah, the poll showed up, you should be able to see yeah. it. Good, okay. After a while. Uh, I'm sorry? You have to, if you want to post the results, there's a little button there, I should say post results. Um, I'm looking, publish polling results. Um, all I'm seeing is done and start a poll. I don't know if anyone's asked. Uh, it's on. It's where the chat would be. Where the show it should show you all. The oh, um, uh, polling. Yeah. Um, hmm. User response. No. Okay. This is not. I'm having some uh, issues with this. Uh, okay. Um, I don't. Uh, should have practiced this. Sorry, everybody. Um, well, moving on. Um, I, so yeah, um, I'm going to be talking about briefly about what this option does, um, the sort of capabilities of it, and um, the how I've been extending it to work on to try to detect vulnerabilities in the Linux kernel. And um, I guess the caveat here is that I'm a I'm coming this from the GCC side of things. I'm a compiler developer. Um, I'm very much a newbie when it comes to the kernel and um, also, I'm I'm not that knowledgeable about from the. I mean, this is the assurance, um, you know, the, um, my, the micro conference. So, and I'm not. Um, I've sort of been coming at this from the point of view of compiler warnings. Um, so, for example, my my detection can have false both false positives and false negatives. It can miss things, and I'm wondering to what extent that's a deal breaker in within this community. Anyway. Um, I worked on, um, so yeah, I added this new interprocedural pass to the compiler to GCC and GCC 10. Um, and it's really only useful for C code right now, I should say, but that's okay because this is, we're talking about Linux. Um, and it does a much more expensive, if you turn on this option, it does a much more expensive analysis um, than we've typically done for compiler warnings in GCC and can greatly increase your compile time. But then there's a whole bunch of compile time warnings that are associated that are sort of key directly off of this analysis. Um, and um, it uses state, well, amongst other things, it allows you to attach state machines um, to the analyzer so that you can analyze, the, the, the one example is analyzing um, uh, heap state. So you could, if a point, if free is called on a pointer, that pointer is transitioned to the has been freed state. And if you call free on it again, that's a double three. Uh, and so there's sort of a, a infrastructure for attack running state machines um, as you as we interprocedurally explore the paths through the user's code. And um, and yeah, the slide I've got shows the various warnings that I've, uh, or at least list numbers of the various warnings I've, I've added. Um, for GCC 12, which is currently under development, uh, Feature Freeze is in November of uh, this year and will release uh, in the spring of next year. Uh, and the, the main one I've added, uh, a change I've made, is I'm tracking whether values are initialized or not at the per bit level in a path sensitive interprocedural way. Um, and uh, which is much, much more um, uh, precise, I guess, than the existing GCC warning for un uninitialized values. And so, um, the, well, as I said earlier, the, um, the analyzer is, is neither sound nor complete. Uh, and as I said, I'm coming at this from a, um, I make a number of trade-offs in terms of how I'm modeling state inside the program as I'm exploring the paths through the code. Uh, so I try, for example, I if there's a memory allocation versus a stack allocation, I will split the analysis on that path and keep that split uh, until the uh, until that pointer it, it goes out of scope or or is is dead in fact. Um, and the um, but and so so I try and keep interesting paths alive. Uh, or interesting splits in the state uh, for some definition of the word interesting, but I'm using a bunch of heuristics to just to try and um, 
basically to try and ensure that the analysis terminates in a reasonable amount of time and indeed terminates because I mean, you can't just arbitrarily explore every path and every state in the code um, for, uh, because the it explodes um, exponentially. Um, and so there are various ways in which the analysis can fail to find um, real problems and also can re mistakenly report false positives. And as I say, I don't know how much of a deal breaker that is within the, you know, from a um, the, the functional safety community perspective, but I am new to the kernel and um, I'm, this is in many ways, I'm trying to get feedback on, on, um, on, the, on what's useful and, and, and what isn't here. Um, so in the spring, I started looking at historical security vulnerabilities in the Linux kernel. And I was thinking, well, I've got all this infrastructure for finding, well, you know, classic problems in user space code. Um, but, you know, Red Hat, we care a lot about the kernel. And I thought, well, how can I this benefit the kernel team? Um, so I was looking, and I reckoned there were two broad categories of vulnerability that would be relatively easy to extend the analyzer to detect. To detect one is information leaks where uninitialized values are coming are copied from the kernel um, back across into a trust boundary into say user space or across the network and um, and that allows an attacker to uh, do reconnaissance uh, as part of a, uh, a wider attack to get information about let's say for example where um, where particular things are located inside the kernel, which particular pointer addresses. Um, and the other being, uh, and the other broad category is taint detection, I call it, uh, like Perl's taint mode. But for um, looking at kind of data flowing the other way, if you've got um, values coming from user space, for example, as system calls, as ioctals, or potentially from a hostile USB device or from the network, can we detect that trust boundary and detect do those values get used in an in an in a um without sanitization um and get you say as an array index or a divisor so that an attacker can inject a divide by zero in into the kernel and i um foolishly thought that information le info leaks would be relatively easy to detect and be a good way of sort of dipping my toes in into the kernel source code um and um and and so i was exploring that um, and then sort of build up towards that. So the taint detection seemed potentially higher value because you can actually use it to directly do denial of service attacks and get root as opposed to just doing surveillance for um, a, 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 or a reconnaissance, I should say, for another attack. Um, so a trivial example of a uh, historical example from four years ago of an info leak. We have a, a struct um, with inside a driver with some um, fields and uh, hopefully this code is well, basically, we create one of these uh, a, a stack on the this struct on the stack. We populate all the fields, and we do with some values, and we do copy to user, which is a classic sort of pattern in the in driver code. And there's a vulnerability here, which um, so I have a a heavily patched version of GCC 12 or GCC trunk, I should say. Um, most of my changes are that I made are sort of infrastructural changes to my analyzer work. And most of the, and those changes are in, in trunk for GCC 12. But I've got some extra patches on top for kernel specific warnings. And here's the warning about that. It says, uh, yeah, rather verbosely, potential exposure of sensitive information by copying uninitialized data from stack across trust boundary, the CWE code and uh, the command line option dash W analyzer exposure through uninit copy. Um, which is rather verbose, but and in more verbosely, I, I try and I sh try and show the pertinent aspects of the code. Here is where the onstat buffer is created. Um, its capacity is 52 bytes. Here is where in the code the the copy to user space happens. And you might reasonably think, well, I initialize the code's initializing all the fields. What's the problem? And so um, and the problem here is that there's two padding bytes. And so in my warning, um, internally, it's looking at, at the per bit level, at the particular path through the code that it shows via ASCII art in the last slide, um, that it knows which bits are uninitialized on this path and that have been copied to user space. Um, but to present it to the user, I sort of iterate through all the fields in the struct and I try and show which fields are 
fully, fully uninitialized or partially initialized. And similarly, here we have padding. And here's the, um, the struct declaration, the sort of, it's after this field of the padding bytes. I can also generate a fix it hint and GCC can actually generate a patch from that to fix the problem. Um, a similar example, uh, this, is a, this is a vulnerability from 10 years ago, um, which I've had to heavily edit um, to get it to fit on a slide. Um, and so we have a struct that's created on the stack. It has a, a slot number and it has a pair of slots. We populate that from user space with a copy from user call. Um, and we get a pointer to that on stack buffer. We do a bit of sanitization and then we um, modify a, another data structure in the, in the kernel using the value we just got. And there's a vulnerability on this line, uh, if, which I you're, told you in if you attended Monday's talk. Uh, I don't know if anyone can spot it. Um, and the vulnerability is, is that we're only validating um, that the, um, the num, info num is, um, hasn't exceeded the upper bounds of this array, but um, it's actually a signed integer. And so the attacker can supply a, uh, a negative value. And that, therefore, this, this write is a write to an attacker control arbitrary location inside the kernel. And so my patched version of GCC can detect this. Uh, it does. It's um, again. I, I did simplify this case, and right now it doesn't detect the the actual historical code um, for this vulnerability. But it does detect the the simplified version. So yeah, warning: use of attacker control value. Um, so star info dot num, which could probably be improved in, in array lookup without checking for negative. Um, and I do a. I use a. I structure things so that. Um, I have various, um, various different wordings. I'm trying to express exactly what the problem is, like what was checked and what wasn't checked. So yeah, without checking for negative seems to be the best way of expressing to the, the programmer that what's going on here. And again, it shows the, the path through the code uh, with a sort of ASCII art sort of, um, we follow this branch to get to here and, um, and the follow, when we follow that branch to get to there, then that's where the, um, uh, the, the, the use happens. What it doesn't show and what I hope to show is why the analyzer thinks that this is attacker controlled. And I mean, it should basically highlight, I guess, that the copy from user happens here. And therefore, at that point, um, SBUF is, um, is attacker controlled. And, um, and therefore, um, at this point, info-num is attacker controlled. So that is one error I do want to fix. And so it gets into the kind of where should this code live? Um, because this is, I mean, right now my branch has some, does def, my GCC branch, which is, um, uh, it detects, it, it's got some very kernel specific hacks, like it, special cases, copy from user, copy to user. And I've been looking at, um, well, can I make this less kernel specific and do things so that other projects could use it? And also if this is really just kernel specific, it probably shouldn't live in the GCC source tree as I upstream this. Where should it live? Should it live as a plugin in the Linux um, source tree, in the Linux source tree, or do I, um, or do I? Can we express um, sort of ways of marking the code um, to um, to express well? What is the the boundary, the, the trust boundary? Um, and so I've got some ideas on this this slide. Um, uh, we have an existing attribute in GCC. If you excuse is... me, <clears throat> so it's yeah. already annotated as underscore underscore user as to address a different address space. Mm. Yeah, um, potentially I c that could be done. The the um, we could use that. That's a good idea. Um, we could. Uh, I think right now by right default GCC turns user into it, it, it goes away. It becomes white space. Um, we could turn that into a GCC attribute. Um, and uh, it sounds like um, um, let's have an attribute address space for that. Uh, I think we GCC already has an attribute address space and it uses it for something slightly different. Or I, I, I have dim memories of looking at it a long time ago and um, something wasn't quite ready. So maybe that's something I, to do is to reevaluate whether GCC can use um, 
um, we can provide a attribute address space um, that um, certainly the analyzer can pick up on uh, that given a suitable configuration of the kernel build. Um, yeah, the, 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 the underscore underscore user you have right there is already all over the place in the kernel. That's exactly yeah, what I'm yeah. The, 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 I guess the, um, the, 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 the issue here is that um, the analyzer needs to know that this, it sees there's a function with a particular name, whatever, and it, it's taking a user space parameter and a non, a user space pointer and a kernel space pointer and an unsigned long. It needs to know that this is a copy. Um, and the, 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 the semantics here are, uh, right now is that the analyzer looks, sees a copy to user and says, okay, if I see uninitialized data flowing across this, okay, this okay, is a so copy. I, 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 just so I express your question, because you're going on, I'm not sure if everyone gets it. So the question is not about hmm. annotating the variable. The question is annotating the function that does the copy. Yes. So we yes. need to have some sort of annotation that says copy from user, take, like sort of like a print. What we could use is the, like the print F format that we have where you get warnings for print F's and you could actually make anything that uses a print F format uh, to warn that if the format, if the format doesn't match the parameters. So we could add something like that an attribute above the function to declare that copy from user mm. takes oh. this guy to go this guy. Would that work? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, 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 on the slide I've given the attribute, is, sorry, the attribute is, 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 um, is linked to the function declaration as a whole, but the numbers are expressing which argument number of, of that function decal are, uh, it's referring to. Um, yeah. so, yes. That, yeah. I think we could do something like that. Just, we use it for printf right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, and yeah, so basically the analyzer needs a way of saying this is a copy across a trust boundary where either we're copying data from the kernel back into into user space and we want to complain about information leaks or the other way around the copy from user, which is we're getting data that that is potentially hostile. We want to treat that with care and we want to complain if it's used without sanitization for array indices, sizes of allocations, so on and so forth. Um, the one example, I, another syntax I came up with is I invented an attribute tainted. Um, and if I put that into syscall define x, it means basically every system call, it, um, well, my objective is this, this is anything marked with attribute tainted, the analyzer can say, okay, this is, the, the inputs to this are hostile, um, both direct inputs and one level of indirection, um, if basically if you're provided a pointer. Um, and therefore, if you mark the system call macro with that, all system calls across the kernel get marked with just that one line of annotation that, the, you know, don't trust the inputs. Can, can um, we, instead of using tainted, could it be called like untrusted? Yes. So tainted, the tainted is used for lots of other, as is pretty ambiguous if you ask me. But untrusted okay, would be very. It's, be it's the common name for doing data flow analysis, though. Um, oh, tainted is the right name here. But we use tainted within the kernel all over the place for other things. That's true. Um, yeah, I mean, th th again, it's the sort of where does this code live? Is this a, how much of this is going to be, in GCC itself? Uh, how much lives in the kernel source tree? I, I read, I read of LWN on LWN a couple of months ago with Linus saying how much he hates GCC plugins. So maybe GCC plugins are a non-starter. Um, and I want to try and express all of the semantics in so with the attributes of a GCC. I mean, if it goes into uh, GCC proper. And tainted is the proper word. That's perfectly fine. What we would do, we would just mm -hmm. define it. Maybe we would define a macro called untrusted and use attribute tainted. So in the kernel, yeah. we'll just use a define. That's yeah, right. yeah, yeah. The the other place I found I could use it is in fields of struct de declarations, where there are, you have this pattern where you, for example, the I think it's the ioctl callback in the inode. And there's a store callback in config of S. And basically, anywhere where you have these callbacks um, that you're, you register implementations for, um, I basically, I, I, 
you could add the attribute to the field declaration and I'd be, my implementation basically sees any function that gets registered as a callback handler in one of those structs. The analyzer says, aha, this is an ioctal handler or this is a store handler or whatever, and applies the attribute and the, you know, assumes that the inputs are untrustworthy. The idea being that you can detect um, the, this is like, um, this, like this is handling data coming from a potentially hostile USB device, or this is coming, you know, this is coming from an ioctal um, without having to do so much, uh, a whole, a whole kernel into, you know, link time into procedural analysis of, of that taint, um, or untrustworthiness, if you will. Um, you, you can kind of get it immediately from the, oh, this is an ioctal handler, beware, um, if that makes sense. Um, and, um, yeah, I say, I'm, I'm kind of a, Colonel Newby, um, I, I, so I'm hoping that I'm. This all makes sense, um, and um, yeah. So I'm kind of moving on. Yeah, the, the only kernel code I've written, I tried to write the world's worst kernel module. Um, as a, I have a bunch of unit tests in my branch to bear with lots of sort of reduced um, uh, C code from from the from the example vulnerabilities. And I've been sort of, um, and so I've got unit tests that does does it does the analyzer find this stuff? Uh, but also I want into, I've got this anti-patterns.ko on my GitHub to try and verify the analyzer does also find these things on a um, using the system kernel headers with the regular configuration and, and yeah and, and that works and yeah as I say um, ideas for other tests <laughs> most welcome because I'm I'm sort of coming at this from from the compile, you know, with my compiler hat on, rather than um, sort of knowing things from the, the kernel point of view. Um, and I, I've, I've written an automated script that basically grabs my customized GCC source tree, um, adds, uh, builds it, and then builds the kernel, or builds a kernel on top of it. It takes about four hours to do the kernel build with Dash F Analyzer turned on on a decent machine, which is, a, I guess, a pretty big slowdown. Um, and I've been running it on recent Fedora, RHEL, and upstream kernels, and I've got it to, with at least info leaks, uh, to have zero false positives and one true for, true positive where it's found an actual vulnerability in the all yes config kernel, something that we don't enable in Fedora or RHEL, uh, which I've reported but isn't yet public. Um, so, um, and for that reason, I'm I currently this code is sitting in a um, internal git well most of the code is in gcc upstream but the kernel specific parts are currently just in a repo internally at red hat because i there's an issue of what is responsible disclosure um with a um in in the world of you know free libra open source static analysis tools is this if you know it's going to find zero day if you run it and it finds a you know, an unpatched vulnerability in the kernel, that's not good. Um, so um, I, I, I'm kind of wondering what the, the process there should be. Um, and so, yeah, in terms of the current status of this, lots of enabling work, uh, basically, or like the tracking of uninitialized bits, um, that's all in GCC trunk, and there's a new warning there relating to that. Um, but yeah, there's the sort of what color do we paint the bike shed in terms of uh, what should the syntax be like, um, and um, and 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 for 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 that for marking that that boundary between user space and kernel space, and indeed, way hopefully we can express it all in a sort of with a general enough semantics that it can all just go into GCC, and not live in the kernel source tree. I hope I think, or with a very minimal patch um, to just. Um, to, 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 to with a few attributes here and there. Um, that's why I like the doing in system call X or whatever, because I don't want you to have to add annotations everywhere throughout the kernel, because um, my experience is that users hate doing that. Um, and, um, you know, and David, if, I think we, any we are, this is for microconference, so we want more of a discussion now. So, yeah, I'm so, sorry. Uh, yeah. So, David, I was going to uh, say that you have several questions if you want in the chat, questions and then comments. Mm -hmm. So, if you want to take a look at them and see uh, if you, uh, if maybe some of some of your questions are already answered, the ones that you're asking. Yeah, um, where are we here? I see. Uh, 
Case Cook, if I'm pronouncing your name correctly, I apologize if not. Um, yeah. Plugins should go away. Everything, yeah. Untrusted inputs, attribute tainted. Yeah, that looks. Um, oh, and sys module taint. Oh, I see. You, you use the terminology tainted kernel for if a, a third party module has been um, loaded or, or I, what I, I can't. Other things. Yeah, there's a whole lot of different taint flags. Um, so, so, so from the perspective of data flow analysis, tainting, um, this, is, this is cool. I would like to see um, the, the, the taint tracking actually work. Um, the issue I'm concerned about is that right now without LTO, this seems like it would be very, very shallow in the sense that it wouldn't leave like one function. Um, so having, having that information actually flow down across the whole, you know, function call graph um, where you can say, oh yeah, these are the structures that got written to the heap that contain the, you know, totally unchecked data from a device, from a network packet, from syscall information. I think that's where we really want to, uh, have all those checks and, and i think that it seems like lto is going to be required for that yeah yeah i the analyzer has some um it's basically a proof of concept of lto analysis um but if you try and use it on anything other than, than my toy example it just explodes um so that obviously would need fixing the uh but if we have enough uh, annotation across function calls, I mean, when you have a structure that's passed to a function call that has, you know, this is unsafe, it should handle a lot more cases, even without the LTO implemented. Hmm. Is that? Yeah. To some extent. But... Um, I mean, the, the problems I've seen are where, you know, you do a bunch of deserialization, basically, and you're, you're putting data from one place into another and far, far away, you take something back out of the heap and use it as an array index or something. And that's it's like, oh, that array index actually originated from some blob that came from user space, but that was, you know, two, three syscalls ago and it was stored here waiting to explode, stuff like that. And so that like long-term uh, taint, taint tracking, it, it was is definitely something I would like to see, but it may need to be more runtime checking than static. Yep. Well, I think um, I wouldn't want to stop this work. I I I, I like what you, I see here. I, I yeah, think no, it's, it's definitely good. definitely positive. Uh, positive. I would, and I mean for false positives, I guess the best thing to do is if we have a way to quiet it. Maybe especially since uh, Linus adds that you know dash w error message in there. So now a false positive could fail the build if this is enabled. So. But I think this is something we definitely want so, um, in the kernel. Yeah, as far as false positives, I mean, we have a long history of enabling things globally as we just slowly fix them all, whether that takes one release or 10 releases, just go through it till they're all fixed and then turn it on. So yeah, I'd, I'd like to see it. And like I said, the attribute stuff shouldn't be a problem. We use macros like extensively, so we could always wrap, use, I guess, like we mentioned the taint, we could call it something else. So what's in the kernel will be called something different just because we have a macro defined specifically for it. We do that all over the place. Hmm. Yeah. Um, and I, I guess there's the, the way I've structured it is with um, the dash app analyzer as a compiler warning. Is that a um it sounds like lto is really what you want but um uh, is it still useful that way i mean the idea is to get, at least get a shallow my hope is that if i can get it fast enough that you might want to still turn it on as you're writing the code is that feasible or is, is that is that is that something people do i mean what sort of slowdown is you know is the the pain point in terms of well it'll be a good fig option probably um, so if, builds, we would, if yeah. so those that don't want it could just turn off i have automated builds uh, all the time that i don't really care about it takes 13 hours to go through all the builds that i have so i just kick it off before i go to bed and let it run overnight and it gives me all my error messages so that's something that i don't think is an issue as long as you could disable it for those that are you know debugging something else and they're not they don't want to have a slow build uh, mm. Which, like I said, if it's an option, we have the, the kernel's highly configurable. We can easily just keep it off as a config option. Uh, 
to enable this. So that's why I envision. I don't think that would be an issue. Um, I think there was something else that was I mentioned that um, you said. I can't remember what it was. Lost my train of thought. But no, I think this is something you should pursue. Uh, even if you, I don't think you have to worry. A case uh, that you want to make a comment about his worry that this might expose the zero day. I mean, we have sparse. Are you familiar with the sparse utility that we run? Mm -hmm. So we run sparse all the time that does something similar, but you have to run that separately. Yeah, I mean, we yeah. have what 800 zero days listed on the syscaller dashboard. <laughs> so don't worry about the zero days. That's, that's the point. Yeah. It's supposed to find the problems. If it's going to find yeah. the problem, we fix it. I mean, you've already you already sent one, so you just hmm. that's, <laughs> that's the process. Yep. So once you, if you were to push this out, I'm sure yes, the black hats will use it, but the white hats will as well. And we have, you know, we'll be testing no, it. No, no. Sure. The, the black hats already know. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> they already no, basically, have these yeah. tools. <laughs> yes. It's they have their own tools that it. they're not sharing with us. So right. yes, don't be afraid of sharing this with us just because you're thinking that people will abuse this. Those that want to abuse this have their own tools that's already doing this. Hmm. Yeah, I mean it's it's maybe it's the gray area there because um in term, in terms of analyzing the parts, there there are parameters you can use to use more CPU time to say I'm gonna just explore deeper if the state seems to be explo exploding. So potentially there's an arms race there between uh, how deeply you want to um, explore versus, yeah, anyway, um, I should let other people talk, sorry. <laughs> Where are we? Okay, so um, more comments on that? Yeah. No, I'll just leave my video up since it takes a lot of clicks to start it again. <laughs> I, I have a question, which is um, how best to integrate this then into the upstream kernel um, test testing. Um, I, you mentioned a, a configuration. I should, I'm presuming I should add a configuration option to the kernel to, uh, to well, add dash F analyzer or My assumption or. is that if you just create this for us, what yeah. a case, you know, there's lots of people that could just say, so you don't have to learn, unless you want to learn how to do all this uh, and have your kernel contributions. If you just have this, we'll find a way. We'll okay. maybe just send it to us and we'll get it in there. Great, okay, thanks. I guess the other is the opportunity cost, which is, is there something else that I could be working on that would better benefit the kernel um, in terms of security or, because I mean, I'm, I'm a GCC developer. Uh, um, are, are you coming to Friday's um, Kernel security features in compilers. Thing. That's my plan. Yeah. Okay. Good. Then, then that's that's the place to be. Cool. So one minute left. Oh, if Peter Zolstra wants to come in, and make any statements. Okay, <clears throat> so David, just look at the chat. Did we cover? Did I? Did we cover everything that was said in the chat? I'm just looking through it now, um, and I think so. I think there are some other comments that you can look at and then continue the discussion. Um, also, we're coming up on a break anyway. Great. Okay. okay. Just a minute. Cool. Oh, thank, thank you, you everyone. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, David. Okay, so now we're having a break. Uh, and uh, the room, anyways, uh, will uh, keep on going. And um, we will reconvene uh, uh, in 20 minutes. If you want to um, create a poll, you can. Yep, Gab, then for us, when everybody comes back. Uh, Go for it, Steve, and then just switch over to the uh, click when you're back. <laughs> Slide. Okay, so um, what I want to discuss. Um,
and I think it's related to uh, dependability and assurance is the question how we are dealing with bugs in the kernel. So what, and I think we'll have to start with the question, what is a bug? And then look into how do we actually track bugs and what is the impact of a bug? And um, and I'll show a few examples and hopefully throughout this dis discussion, we can actually um, come up with a few more aspects that I didn't mention. Um, yeah. So the first question is, so what's a bug um, to start with? And I just put together a number of um, examples that you can come across that one person might consider a bug, another person just might consider it uh, some kind of code improvement, but doesn't really consider it bug in in their own word, right? So um, something that we probably would uh, all consider a bug is a, a possible race condition that, that we can hit um, or a failing test case in XFS tests. Um, other things that only security people care about is information leaks from the kernel. Um, we heard yesterday in the testing and fuzzing microconference, well, the system call can actually change the error no value it returns. Um, and we still believe that that system call is backwards compatible. Others might say that's strange, that's changing the specification, so it's a bug. Uh, and of course, you could even go further and say, even a spelling mistake in a comment in the source code is a bug, or a static analysis finding that someone should address is a bug, or a compiler warning is a bug, um, or even a code snippet in the documentation that doesn't work at the moment is a bug. So these are all different examples that we might name a bug. And what I want to do is define what a bug is in the widest sense that we can think of. And I'll do so by saying, well, every commit that doesn't add a feature um, is a bug fix commit. And the initial trigger that motivated that change is the bug. So we have something that's somehow a locally bound aspect, somehow related to the content in the kernel repository that motivated someone to do a change. And it's not adding some significant new functionality for any stakeholder. That's what we consider a bug in this uh, further discussion. So now we're going to look into questions. Who is actually identifying bugs? Um, how are bugs reported? How are bugs tracked? Who cares about specific bugs and, and what actions and what uh, how, how, how what actions really happen? How fast? How reliable um, are they? And I think uh, the question that we want to understand is which tools really exist um, in this community for bug detection and for bug tracking. And a bug detector is right, it finds some kind of bug, as I defined before, some aspect that should consider a fix on some version, some config, um, and the bug detector can also check afterwards if a fix was somehow addressing that point or not. We have a bug tracker that collects all those bug reports and um, that relates them to each other, aggregates information and reports that further to the upstream development community. So for maintainers or bug fixing developers, trying to get some kind of summary of what's currently known um, or uh, reporting updates on some status bug is now fixed or um, it doesn't appear anymore or there's something new. And of course, downstream users as well 
might be interested in, okay, what's actually, um, what has changed from one version to the other? And is that, is that a reason to actually do an update? Okay, so that's the, 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 the basic flow that we expect around bug reporting and bug tracking. And we'll look into five examples um, where we use very different tools um, as of now, or actually don't have tools in place at all. So we'll start with a, a bug report by a human kernel user, look into how does that differ from bug reports by an automated testing system? What is a bug report when it's about a compiler warning? And what's a bug report identified by fuzzing? And what's the bug report for static analysis? And that should give us a rough overview of what's available in the kernel. Okay, so uh, let's start with a bug report by a a human kernel user. Basically, we have a documentation page that guides uh, a human how to report um, something they encounter. You can either use Bugzilla kernel org for some subsystems or send something to regressions uh, list Linux kernel. Um, and uh, Yes, there are some some potential future tools that uh, Thorsten Lim, who uh, is envisioning um, to 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 allow bug tracking of those uh, aspects. Uh, Regspot is kind of his his idea in that direction. Then we have bug reports from automated testing systems. I think then we also have a number of. Uh, tools available, Lava, Fuego, uh, Kernel CI and KCIDB and various others um, that uh, build kernels, that test kernels and um, then report um, uh, the, the test reports. But I, what is unclear to me is actually how does back tracking work for those, right? Is there a suitable identifier once you see a failed test and you can consider that, give that some kind of bug identifier? Um, how do you actually show that a bug is fixed? How do you record um, that um, bug fixed and uh, link it against a commit? Um, so that basically others also see, okay, this isn't just a coincidence that this um, failed test is now working again, but it was actually done on purpose uh, by a certain change. Um, similarly, for compiler warning bug reports, there are a number of resources that basically already provide something. Uh, Stephen, uh, Stephen Rothwell provides email notifications on Linux Next. Um, there's the Clang built Linux, Linux GitHub tracker where they collect compiler warnings on Clang. You can look into kernel CI build logs um, that reports um, feedback on compiler warnings and there's kernel test robot that provides you feedback as well. And there's a new compiler warning. And here the challenges that we are seeing is that there is a right, question on, is that actually parsed precisely? How's that automated? How's that tracked? Um, and, and how do I actually get a consistent report from those various tools? Or even are they reported at all um, to the developer? Okay, so maybe two more. Fuzzing uh, also identified the problem of having a bug report and tracking that for SysBot uh, is basically a back bug tracking machinery by itself because uh, Dimitri basically identified that for the bug tracking he wanted to do with his machinery, there was nothing suitable available. And 
And that is for the one instance that we know if there are other syscaller instances, it's actually even more complicated to understand how they could uh, report and manage bug tracking when there are so many uh, various non-unsynchronized uh, syspot instances running. So what there I think the challenge is, and we actually provide something suitable before the next tool comes along and, and tries to rebuild such a tool again. And yes, we've seen also static analysis bug reports. Um, there's a Quarity and the Quarity bot that uh, Colin King and, and Keys is um, basically working on and uh, we've been working on um, some early testing with uh, a to an open source tool from, from Ericsson that also tracks static analysis findings over time. Yes, so once we've seen that we actually have all those different tools for bug, um, bug reporting and bug tracking, the question is really how can we make that uh, useful and aggregate that information so that maintainers can uh, make choices on, okay, what are they actually going to integrate? What are they going to sit in a, in a pull request? And um, where can they reach out to the original developer and ask to, to, to refactor something if they, if they get uh, feedback from those systems? Yeah, so here we've now seen an overview, and I think with that I actually want to open the discussion on, let's say, other tools, resources, use cases that I didn't describe that are maybe similar to those um, that, uh, that are completely different possibly, and of course, where's the potential for synergies, I mean. I see already Shion is uh, pointing something out in kernel CI, but um, yeah, it would be interesting to find out how the landscape in the future could look like. And uh, especially how the community members that aren't, uh, let's say, so doing development or maintenance work can actually assist by just helping in tracking bugs um, and connecting the dots between um, what bug reporting tools or bug reporting humans provide and what the maintainers pick up and how it, how that uh, evolves the, the code base. Lucas, you do have a few comments and questions in the yes. chat if you want to take That's a look. That's great. Thank yeah. you. Okay, yeah, otherwise I would open the discussion um, as I read. Yeah. Yes, so it may, may I'll just read out, but the uh, uh, case wrote. Um, So I think one of the one of the, the challenges is, of course, we have all those bug reporting tools, but they are triggered um, too early, or no, they're triggered too late. So once it's actually integrated, and the question is, um, how can we how can we build something that the CI systems and all the bug detecting tools that we have um, are fast enough um, to uh, warn the maintainer not to take a commit before before it's actually on Linux next? Well, I don't think the problem is Linux next. It's we don't want to in uh, Linux history. Linux next is a perfectly fine place to have it for bug for testing the bug uh, fixing. Well, but, but it doesn't get but, the next. 
prefer not to get the next, but still, you know, if it gets it to next, it's that's I thought next was basically where you do all the integrate, well, integrated testing and such. But but Stephen, if I say, well, the bug is a spelling mistake in a comment, and you see there's a uh, you take a patch, it's already in your tree, and then someone comes and says, oh, here's a spelling mistake in, in, this, in this comment. You're not going to say, well, I'm going to retract what Correct. I did because of that, right? So you might have done a different decision beforehand and said, okay, wait, this isn't perfect yet. Can you still rework it? But right, there's already a different threshold at that point when it is in Linux next. You're gonna say, well, now it's there, please provide another patch on top. And I mean, that's great for statistics and yeah, we have 50,000 changes every two weeks, but it's really But like I said, are noise, we worried? Right? I mean, spelling fixes, uh, that's just for those reading code. Yes, it's a bug. We should have spelling fixes in there. But I'm not worried about security problems because of a spelling mistake. Um, I'm going to say typo squatting, Steve. Typo, that... squat, typo squatting is a known vec attack vector. OK, I have to go look that up. <laughs> <laughs> OK. But yeah, I, 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 spelling mistakes um, you know, have been used in the past. Um, at, at, usually at the component level, but there's nothing to say that something someone can't get clever in the kernel too. Are they checking but to make not... sure that if it's only text that's being changed, it's pretty easy to tell that from a patch. Mark, are you speaking? Trying to say anything? I see your name pop in. Um, I, I was going to jump in, but after you finish this it's... Oh. go ahead yeah. mark. go ahead mark um yeah and now i i uh, got slightly uh, yeah so one of, uh, one of the things um that's been going on uh, the thing that's been going on in the chat is a discussion of um can we get any of this um to the point where linus is checking it and refusing to merge things that um are breaking some critical set of tests. I think another question is what is Linus using to test, you know, before he pushes out to his tree? From what I can tell from this re recent one, it's that he just types make in his Fedora shell because he was the only person who hit a, uh, a Wang setting bug. None of the other CIs did. Him being the only one that hit something isn't proof that all he does is make. Uh, so it required being in a interactive bash shell, and all the other CIs um, were were setting the standard C lang or having it unset, and so he wasn't in a. Well, it didn't appear to be inside a container, but anyway, it doesn't matter. But, but, if we had a common set of CI that we could point to in merge requests and say, look, this all passes, no warnings for all these configurations, please merge my stuff, Linus might be happier. Isn't that what we basically zero day does? I mean, every time you push to a branch? Kind of, but there's no good summary. Yeah, you, isn't you that what we do? Isn't that what we do for stable though? Stable releases come out and then several uh, uh, test strings yeah. go test them. So are you really talking about something similar? Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, I, I think that would get a lot as a long way. I mean, Greg does. I mean, it's not great CI, but it's um, massively better than what we have uh, for mainline itself. Mm -hmm. Right. I think what got brought up in chat somewhere here was just sort of having a, a kind of a regular way to 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 put that into pull requests. Like, 
here's the matrix that I did testing on. You can see it here. And you know that doesn't mean everyone has to use the same CI, but at least if there's some common way for us to say, here are the you know the configurations that got tested and we see no new warnings or whatever. And that way there's sort of a common format in the pull requests that can be scanned by a human and say, oh yeah, okay, that, that looks good. I wonder if we should have the pull request go like auto, like when you do a pull request, if we can automate it. So all pull requests to at least Linus or maybe to, you know, well, in Linux next it happens, but maybe to Linus that it goes to an automated session. Of course, this would be, be Linus's say to do this or not, but if we had an automated way that everything that goes to him goes through some sort of test suite first before he actually even sees it, Ideally, um, it, that information would also be in the patch uh, that what testing has been done. Uh, some maintainers push for that information, some don't. Um, so that would be another indication that what kind of testing was done on a patch itself. However, it doesn't mean that we are not going to find problems when we are trying to integrate in the Linux next, right? So, right. yes, uh, pull request uh, doing some kind of sanity checking on pull requests, I think would be a good idea. Well, then, okay, if it's Linux X, the way Linux X gets pulled in is I push it up to my 4 next branch, and then Steven pulls it into his. Well, if Steven has all these tests, so before, he, so maybe every branch that he pulls in. You, you, or... you, you, you can't run any more tests on Linux next. Okay. Like, the, 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 there's a 24 hour cycle in which you've got to go from Linux's tree to Linux next involving a lot of builds already um mm -hmm. and uh, at some point the linux next maintainer needs to sleep and eat well, th and... i'm saying this should be automated not something he but yeah so the, the uh the the problem is that every merge in linux next you, you don't have the tree until you're part way through the merge uh you, you need uh, if you're going to do an integration test you need to be at the point in linux next where you're about to pull in the tree pull in the tree test it and then you see what happens Right, but yeah. I think there, we can have the machinery happen after that, right? There's, there's already the existing integration work that happens to produce mm. next, you, but then once it's produced, yes, you throw yes, it in the machinery. Uh, yes, uh, absolutely. We should be testing next itself. Yes, absolutely. I'm, I'm just saying that the idea of having Stephen do it as part of the next merge is um, anything that gets added to the next merge process, it needs to be very, very, very quick. I mean, don't we already do next testing though? There is a lot of testing that happens and it all, it depends on when I guess maintainers push it to next, right? Do we let it soak for a little, uh, a few days before we send it to Linus? Right, there's tons of testing, but there isn't mm -hmm. a, a common way to describe to Linus, here is what passed. Like these are the things I am looking at as a maintainer for this tree and it passed these things that I care about. Here is what I care about. Um, that way, we don't have to depend on a single specific CI or anything, and then Linus can say, oh, you don't seem to care about this thing I think you should care about, and et cetera. So he can analyze what, what you know, got tested for that particular pull request. Well, this sounds like something that should probably be brought up in the maintainer summit or something asking Linus, but the... I agree. I, I mean, I have my own little test suite that's specific for F-Trace, although because F-Trace is so broad, it actually usually finds bugs all over the place. Um, it just does crazy tra trace. I just kick off a bunch of crazy stuff and trace it. And, you know, that opens up sometimes the tracing slows things down. It opens up uh, race windows in other areas and triggers bugs. But the whole process takes between eight to 13 hours to run for me. Uh, I mean, I could just say it's what I do. I think Linus knows what I run. Every person, every maintainer is going to have a different test suite that they're going mm -hmm. to get. And, and Absolutely. On, on on the other end of things, I don't have very much of the hardware that my subsystems support. So my te you know any testing I personally run is an absolute joke, really, uh, because I just physically can't run a lot of this stuff, and uh, I'm not going to start either because um, uh, I don't really have space to put that much hardware in my home. And I and I think one of the challenges is right. Even if Stephen says, well, Linus knows what I'm doing, maybe there are two, three other people that do also know that. Um, if that evolves or if that breaks down, there's really nobody that 
can that 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 is informed right because you're basically maybe you decide i'm building something i'm adding something to it and since then you actually improve the quality of your uh, pull requests in some regard uh, nobody's going to know um in, in the initial state right because you don't have a, a reference where you point to and say look here are the here are the test results in some way that you can look at them and again right when the dependability track here that's one of those questions how do i provide an evidence that that Stephen actually did that kind of test because you don't want me to ask you with every git pull oh Stephen, did you do this again the way you did it right that's just going to be annoying for you um someone asking you all those questions and I mean, we do have the self test there. That that's one thing. That's part of my test suite is always run all the self tests. Um, and well, you I'm can sure... get the self test running. Well done. Well, no, I no, I run my own self tests. I have the self test for what I care about, and I believe maybe like Mark. I don't know if there's a way of saying, is there a way for when you get patches from someone who has the hardware? Can you just say, did you run these tests? So maybe I mean, the question is, do they? They can say yes and not. That's another problem. Is how do we know they? Ran those tests and just didn't just say yes. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't personally have test suites, but I can do that. But I know. I mean, I know the V4L people and the graphics people have mm -hmm. uh, some pretty good um, stuff already. Um, and like you say, even if you have that requirement, there's going to be a trust thing where they could just be lying. Uh, so, so Mark, for your pro, uh, uh, issue that you're facing, a hardware self test K self test doesn't have. Um, a whole lot of hardware coverage, right? So you can test it, but um, run self tests and such, but you won't get a good coverage anyway for the issues that you are looking at. Uh, yeah, um, some of it you, um, you I could in principle, although I mean, I, uh, I think K U for some of it K unit is a better fit, but same mm -hmm. principle, of course. Yes, you're right. Media uh, V4L has a better uh, test suite. And when I uh, do something there, I usually attach a test script um, in terms of uh, being able to test all the corner cases, media being the complex subsystem, one of the complex subsystems. But it would be nice to have um, maintainers have a checklist and say, this is what we would like to run. We would like you to run when you send a patch. Um, that would be the first step, and then you know, uh, slowly we it could be uh, go all the way up to pull requests. So you kind of have to layer this in as well. That's uh, what I think is an effective way. So uh, I have a question, sure, but isn't that, I mean, you talked about a checklist, you know, to for contributors, you know, before they submit a patch, you know, to make sure it is tested. Um, that, so, so basically, that would rely on just, just on the, on the word of the contributors, right? So basically what you're saying, I mean, it's different from the principle of getting patches, right? So that's the first step, right? And when you are, we do have an expectation that when somebody sends a patch that it is tested um, to some extent. Um, it's It might not be a complete test. For example, networking subsystem, they rely on having uh, self-tests pass on those tests. I think, um, ex XFS probably tests need to be run for file system changes. So that's kind of what I'm talking about. If we know, sometimes I fix a bug in a subsystem and then I do not always know which tests should be run other than the obvious ones. So I guess there are two kind of problems here. One is how do you know what tests you run for what subsystem? And then you could just have something like an entry in maintainers that's like, 
testing run this script or read this doc for what to test for this subsystem and contributors can use that and the other problem on the other side is okay now that a maintainer has a patch that they're deciding whether or not to accept or linus's has a pull request he's deciding whether or not to accept does he have to rerun or does that maintainer need to rerun those tests themselves and is there a greater set of tests they need to run on a greater set of hardware or ask someone else to do that how do you prove that so there's the what tests do you run problem and there's the how do you prove that tests have been run and who runs them and i think right and extending that thought right if you will get some kind of feedback from those test reports some might be well some some might be negative in something failed but let's say we run a spell checker on it something is going to say well there are thousands of spelling mistakes um what is the threshold for for linux right i assume linux is not going to say well okay everything went through but you have thousand uh, spelling mistakes so uh we're not going to make progress here but of course just trying to make aware where is the where is the threshold for certain things um especially because we have tools that point out let's say rather minor issues that eventually get fixed and that's what we usually call trivial fixes right but um eventually someone's going to come across and and debug the maintainer of that there's a spelling fix to be done there's uh, there's some dead code somewhere. There's a compiler warning with a very special thing. Well, so, I mean, compiler that... warnings I usually take a little bit more seriously than just a spelling fix. But with spelling fixes, if someone if I push to Linux next, will I rebase? No, that's exactly it. But if someone sends me, a, I would say just give me another patch and apply the spelling fix before it goes beyond Linux next. That's fine. But but that's that's your personal judgment right and well and I think why would it be linus anyone is... else would have an issue you mean linus will not pull something because of a spelling fix well linus not because right linus has a different threshold that that you agreed with him but also linus has some kind of understanding and if he wants to move that forward there has to be some common common way of figuring that out and communicating that right if he decides tomorrow to say, okay, I'm only going to take something if you don't introduce new spelling mistakes. I, I highly doubt he will he do would. that. Yeah, because but... the community would break down. But basically, right, there are aspects that you, you agree on that are quality issues that are not a blocker. Yes. And, and that needs to somehow be reflected in those test reports because you're going to run XFS tests and they will fail. And there is an agreement in the community that that failure is okay. But it's not clear to anyone else. And, and then you need tools to kind of support that kind of process and communication on, okay, this is still fine and that's not. Oh, time's up. Okay, thanks, Gab. Yeah, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I need to, you know. Okay, so yeah. I think uh, we touched, I think, on a number of interesting questions. So, uh, yeah, we can either use this chat or um, someone suggests if there's some topic of more interest to just meet in a hack room again um, later this day. And my mouse. Yeah. Thanks. Battery probably just died, so I can't even unmute or anything. <laughs> yeah, but it's all okay. yours. Thanks. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lucas. It was uh, uh, really interesting, and uh, let's see how it evolves. Um, so now we are switching to another uh, topic, and. We'll have uh, 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 Priyanka uh, 
and proofs that will um, tell us about possible um, contributions of uh, C groups and namespaces in uh, um, in freedom from interference. So now I'm going to hide myself. Um, so actually, I've made Priyanka a presenter. Um, uh, I don't know. Can you queue up her um, presentation before you make her the presenter? Okay, maybe I will. Uh, okay, so I'll take the presenter then. Yeah, we um, were wondering about how that works. Yeah. It, so you might, yeah. I, I, I think Steve okay. was able to. Uh, there we go. Okay, now it should be okay. So yeah, Priyanka, you are presenter again. So yeah, for yours. Yeah. So thank you everyone uh, for joining. Today, me and Bruce are going to talk about kernel C groups and namespaces, and can they contribute to freedom from interference claims? So on our agenda, we have today is why freedom from interference is important in modern functional safe systems, C groups and namespaces overview and contributions to FFI claim. So uh, firstly, what is freedom from interference? Freedom from interference is the absence of cascading failures between two or more elements that could lead to the violation of a safety requirement. So here are two elements, element A and B. There is a root cause which causes a failure, uh, a fault in element A, resulting in a failure A. And then that failure A becomes the cause of the fault number two, which further results in failure B. So basically there should be a uh, um, uh, their shared resources should be used in such a way that freedom from interference of different elements is ensured. An automotive system consists of multiple software components that interact with each other. The presence of cascading failure from a non ASL or a lower ASL component to a higher ASL component will lead to one or many safety goal violations. So, for example, if there is an ASL B communication module that and that communication module might feed some data into cruise control, which is ASL D. So that module can, um, it feeds the data, the communication module feeds the data into cruise control module so that it can make right decisions in terms of braking and speed control. An instance, where the communication module develops some kind of glitch and is not able to feed the right kind of data, it can be catastrophic. But here, we uh, rather than assigning a higher ASL level to such component, because it increases the cost with, uh, by the significant amount. So in such kind of cases, freedom from interference and safety analysis methods uh, like dependent failure analysis or FMEA can prove to be very effective. Dependent failure analysis not only validates freedom from interference, but as well as independence by identifying cascading failures and as well as common cause failures. So it focuses on single cause or events that could invalidate independence and freedom from interference. So here we see um, modern automotive systems adopt powerful SOCs that are capable of running diverse workloads concurrently. So here we assume there is a ASL B compliant hardware on top of which we have ASL B compliant Linux kernel. And here um, we have two different uh, ASL level uh, applications. One is uh, QM and another is ASL B application. And let's um, 
assume that these are in containers. This is in one container, the QM one, and A's will be is in another container. So QM here is uh, the quality uh, um, quality management. So uh, what, um, why QM here is uh, when the parameters such as severity, exposure, and controllability are at their lowest, safety crit uh, criticality calls for a QM level, which means the component here is not hazardous and does not emphasize any safety requirements. And the development supported by quality management is sufficient for it. The examples for QM could be gaming, radio, door panel, uh, local light, and in case of ASLB, it can be the headlights of the car or IPC instrument panel cluster. So we tend, uh, we intend to have freedom from interference between these two applications here. So uh, from um, here, Bruce will tell, uh, discuss with us how C groups and namespaces contribute to FFI claim and what are the interference types where these features are more effective. So I hand it over to you, Prasad. Thank you, Priyanka. I'll uh, need you to flip slides. I'll just say when to flip them. Thank you. Uh, please go ahead and flip to the next one. Thanks. My name is Bruce, and I'm testing Linux technologies for potential application in an automotive environment. At times, I'm going to channel the mind of a type of developer that I'll call the OEM dev. That's someone in uh, an automotive manufacturer or a, a further downstream, upstream tier supplier to them. This person is a consumer of Linux technology, and they're going to come from a mindset of widely varying experiences um, regarding container technology, especially. Classically, they're embedded devs. Uh, they've, they've got a little microcontroller. There are a dozen of them in the car. They think um, in terms of real time at times. Um, and some of them actually have pretty strong experience with containers, which are more classically thought of as a kind of a, a cloudy thing to a lot of them. So you've heard a bit from, auto, uh, from Priyanka about the automotive space. And so I'll talk a bit about what Linux can do to serve up things to help it out and then perhaps tie the room together. So first thing I'm gonna say is I'm not gonna define what a container is. Uh, I think in terms of tasks and processes and there are many, many controls at hand. Uh, and I'm also not gonna go into container runtime opinions uh, because that's really policy versus mechanism and I'm here to talk about mechanisms. So hang in there with me for a few slides. I'm not gonna deeply recap these technologies, um, but I'm gonna touch on them, touch the landscape briefly to catalyze the discussion. So containers basically primarily lean on C groups and, and namespaces. And these are mechanisms that control views and limit resources and, and help ease contention and, and basically sandbox things. Flip the slide, please. So here we are in 2021 with C groups and C groups have become exciting enough to merit a second version of C groups and container designers for the various engines are using many of these controllers now in various ways, whether they're one or two. Um, Seegers V2 is bringing rootless containers to us, and the take up um, again varies among the, the different container um, runtime projects. And so, C groups are QoS like things. You've got I/O buckets. You account for who's using CPU memory. Uh, there's huge pages. There are several controllers actually, um, and so. That's one piece of the puzzle that I'm going to, as an OEM dev, try to apply to the situation. Flip the slides, please. Another major one is namespaces. And so these are kind of virtualization-like things. They, they provide isolation and sort of a world, a view of the world to the container and certain things exposed within the container are, are exclusive to it. Um, 
there are several namespaces. Each of these are, are orthogonal and uh, applied at various um, sets by the different container engines. And so we can make it look like it has a different host name, a different PID. We can pretend we're PIDO. Uh, we can have mount points to look like file systems. Uh, we can do network namespacing, uh, which is very extensively used in telco and um, also clustered, cloudy, um, SDN-based uh, container management systems. Uh, we can have user group IDs. We can namespace IPC. And, and cgroups itself can be namespaced as a protective uh, mechanism from a leakage to a, an unprivileged container. So flip the slide, please. So we've got these two technologies and I want to think about them. And so the uh, ISO specification says that um, the propagation can be considered. The propagation of failure. So that's the way Priyanka described it, where there's uh, a potential fault in a lower level system or in any system really can it connect to one that I hold to be uh, important and in need of safety. And that sounds a little bit legalistic. So in order to apply that, if I'm the OEM developer, I want to understand the elements at hand and their interactions. And from that, I can perform an analysis, do some testing, and then hopefully make a safety assertion regarding suitability for use at the certain chosen safety level. Um, when I'm engineering these things, nothing's off the table. And so, although I mentioned C groups and namespaces, and that's hopefully what we'll kick around in a minute, everything else is available. So um, the, sorry, I'm, this is an older version of this, of this slides and, and uh, I'm kind of, Kind of work and uh, there, there's slight. I'm, I'm going to make a couple of corrections on the fly. So the systems like Linux Caps, um, SecComp, um, the the parts that do. Um, hold on, let me let me cheat here for a second. Sorry. The um, Linux security modules. These are all available and at hand. And so um, on the slide, it mentions MLS. Um, I wanted to say MCS. And so I was actually going to get a little bit into, uh, suppose I tried to craft a solution and I could use a runtime that combines SecComp, uh, MCS. I would consider MLS, but I would say maybe that's not um, going to map into different safety levels, I'll just stick to the MCS side of SE Linux. Now, in my corrected slide, I mentioned AppArmor. I'll, I'll give a shout out to them. Um, and, and there are other uh, mechanisms. And so I, uh, I'm going to flip the slide. And so during the analysis of all of those available technologies, and choosing a runtime, I'll connect these against the interference types and, and having a way to sort of classify these interference types aids in the understanding and the reasoning. And so I can then decide if I need additional technologies and perhaps ask you all for, for something that I may not see there. So this is the last slide. And, uh, I've classified three types of interference, and this is something that um, Gabriella does very well. In fact, uh, time interference is is a bit like. Um, hang on a check. I'm going to cheat again. It's 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 the things that cause delay. Spatial interference means literally separation of memory spaces, uh, registers, caches, um, and it. it can be described, problems can be described as scribbling in each other's spaces. And then uh, for communication interference, that can be termed as jamming or signal to noise. Can something make so much noise that it actually denies stuff from 
other subsystems. And so we're now at the point where I'm about ready to let folks jump in and, and start talking about what they, they might think is, is there missing. Um, for the, for the time interference side, I, I would be thinking of, of uh, CPU exhaustion, which seems to be controlled by C groups. Latency is covered by niceness. And uh, for, for example, I'd ask, do, do people think they need something similar in C groups to deal with latency activities as opposed to just percentage of CPU? Um, the flow control monitor bit, that's something Gabrielle had, and I'll, I'll let him mention it if he wants. And then for spatial interference, we can pin CPUs, set memory limits, um, IO buckets, and even hide devs. And uh, for communication interference, it's actually possible to turn off networking. And, and this gets a little bit into how containers so far have been very network centric. The, the opinions of the container runtimes basically say a default container is fired up and it can pretty much open a, a real network socket. And, and that's supposed to be your use case. But as an embedded practitioner, I would say, well, I want to do some IPC, shared mem, some SEMS, um, and, a, and a few other things. And so I might manually pull elements in. And so uh, I'm now going to tie it up and say that I haven't seen something leap out as 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 a scary missing thing. And, and I'm going to let it go to the group. I, I tried to pull up the chat, but it's not loading in my browser. So I'm going to let um, Shah or do you um, would you like me to read questions for you? Yeah, I, I would please. love for you to read questions. Yes. Thank you. Priyanka, can you see the chat? Oh uh, yeah, yes, I can. I can see the chat. Oh, here we go. It, it seems. I mean, the, the, and the, yeah, the chat is about uh, the, the box. I think the, the, the previous. Oh no, uh, there are some. Gab, do you have? You, are you? Yeah, I'm looking at Carlos O'Donnell. I mean, this is the one. So, at the hardware level, do 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 I? Any way to control non temporal store bandwidth sharing between containers? Controlling bandwidth between containers, is that what that is? Uh, Bruce, is that I have a bit of context there. Yeah. So I'll give you an example. At the hardware yeah. level, at one point, uh, between Intel, Oracle, and Red Hat, we were looking at a problem that had to do with multiple processes and how much cash line utilization they're given because when you do a store let's say on an x86 there is a finite amount of let's say non-temporal store bandwidth and so depending on how you configure your individual processes you can actually have one process starve a hard a box at the hardware level for non-temporal store bandwidth and affect the performance of everything else on the platform so I don't know that there are great ways to mitigate this, but it definitely falls into uh, time interference because the memory controller and the CPU at the at the bottom level of the stack have some some interaction there. So it was just an open question for me when I see this slide. That's interesting. Are are you? Is it, can I summarize that to say it's like right back thrashing? Um, is is that a good way to? To recap it, that. it is yeah yeah you could recap it as that i mean there are ways i know that intel has a and i'm gonna blank on this they've got a hardware controller for like actual page cache allocation uh, is it cat or something i think it's called cat at the low level and i've never seen cat configured in a way that prevents this kind of stuff so mm -hmm. that's it that's interesting because it um this kind of helps touch on how some of the control elements sort of, of, of smear across. So for example, CPU pinning can help with cache exposure vulnerability problems. However, there is a the potential for immediacy of access based on the pinning and depending, I mean, there are so many ways that caches are structured. Um, 
so I'm, I'm kind of stretching that that a little bit, but it gives a sense that some of these kind of spread across, you know, time or spatial or communicative. And so it's an interesting thing you bring bring up, and nothing nothing leaps out to me, but I, I would say that whenever I hear something like this from from engineers, I would try to craft a test for them. I'm on the QE side, and so um, I would want to say, oh, let me uh, fire up some containers and, and write a little bit of code that does the, those, those yeah, probably some deep level memory access. I'd have to probably size it up pretty well, maybe even look at the particular architecture. Um, the OEM developer, they will have picked a certain architecture and they, they will look deeply at the hardware because the, the person that, that hands over the keys to the car, that, that OEM um, is the one that makes the final assertion about a safety claim. Um, so they're going to look at, you know, the, the hardware manual for that particular SOC, um, and 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 nothing's off the table. Um, yeah, thanks for thanks for that. Um, what's up next? Somebody somebody shout whatever's being typed or or whatever's next, and then and then at the end I've got a couple of little questions I'll throw out as sort of box starters. Uh, uh, so Bruce, I had one question, uh, mm. and um, the question is really uh, around the uh, fact that uh, you, know, you talked about spatial interference, and you also talked about uh, how we need to isolate resources like uh, CPU resources. Um, and uh, today, as far as I know, um, that doesn't exist any way to isolate the CPU resource itself. Uh, uh, for, 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 from a point of view, yes, you can use a, uh, a C group uh, CPU set, and you can, uh, you know, uh, pin CPUs uh, for a container. But uh, each uh, each container still gets the entire view of the system, essentially, and they are not really isolated uh, in that sense. So, what do you mean by spatial interference in this context? So, spatial interference is all physical separation. So that includes memory spaces especially um and it, it'll it kind of touches into one of my questions later so i'm uh, what i like about your question is it it calls into question c groups allows pinning but it still allows certain things to be exposed and is that insufficient for the matter at hand and it i'd have you know personally i'd, I'd have to look into it with uh, we have security people would reach to and say hey what are, you know i've pinned the cpus i have exposure uh what do you, what do you think about that um and you know this gets into a lot of back and forth about how much control is available versus what's in use um and so i'm not going to say it is or is not but i think it's great these kinds of questions are are the, the sorts of things that are good to bring up yeah, you know, I asked this question because um, I was uh, I was recently working on a prototype for a CPU namespace mechanism, and mm. I thought that uh, your um, your your use case uh, for you know, for for removing interference it, it would would be ideal uh, for for what we are doing. So that that's mm. why I, I wondered that if there are use cases uh, around this and if there is really a, a need for it, then 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 I could you know push push forward for for something like this. I'd love to, yeah, I'd love to continue a dialogue and, and maybe establish, uh, especially just kind of kernel wide, not, not just in my, my place where I hang my hat. Um, that sounds, that sounds cool. It's fun to kick new ideas around. Definitely. Thank you. Uh, I, I have a question, Pratik. Um, did you, I mean, um, from for my understanding, so uh, C groups um, allow to uh, specify a CPU set to be used uh, by uh, a certain group of processes, for example, right? So, and uh, that would um, basically it would make practically impossible for this process to run on on other cores, right? Or uh, this process to run on other cores? Yes, yes, you're right. Yes. So, so then my question is. What would be so? Where do you see an advantage of actually making the CPUs 
invisible if anyway they cannot be you know used by the, the process so right uh, so i can think of a couple of reasons uh, one of them is that uh, say if you want to pin to say just four cpus and but your system has let's say a thousand cpus uh, but when you've pinned to four cpus and um, th this information is in the in the c group mechanism and as we know that c group is a control mechanism mm -hmm. and not a display mechanism so your application is is most likely to look at an interface like sysfs or procfs uh, to get uh, its information about how many threads to spawn or how many resources to allocate and there it's probably going to spawn you a thousand threads and uh, uh, even when you are just you know really capped on four cpus so so that that's i believe that's going to hurt your performance uh, that's right. one thing um, another thing i could think of is uh, uh, potential fair use uh, implications right uh, maybe on a multi tenant system you could be like uh, if you know the whole topology of the system, if you know where which CPU is on which node, and you could possibly even cause a denial of service attack in a way. Uh, or if you know where the GPUs are, if, 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 which bus is closer to where, you could probably get an undue latency advantage if you, if you when you're accessing, uh, when you have a workload uh, uh, designed that way. So that that is something that I'm thinking of. Uh, yeah, it, it brings it slightly more closer to a virtual machine, but not quite. Uh, and it does. Uh, I believe it. You know, it, it would probably you know give that uh, performance boost that a uh, you know virtual mach machine or even a Kata container. Let's face it, that that's a virtual machine as well. Uh, the, that could or that would also incur a, a performance uh, loss or a performance penalty that uh, that just having a namespace uh, uh, you wouldn't incur with. Okay. That's interesting. Um, I'll. I'll make I'll make an elaboration just so somebody can clarify me, and this doesn't undermine any of your ideas. But it's my understanding that CPU set is a union of the granted and and pinned CPUs, and so there's some that they can't even see. But I might I might be wrong. So if somebody knows I'm wrong, let me know. Um, I'll also make a a more general comment about. Uh, your line of thinking, Pratik. The the idea as these folks attempt to, to the, the automakers are tempted to collapse more and more stuff into these nice, powerful SOCs that have GPUs. And on there's a temptation to on one system do the body control module, detect pedestrians, and then do telematics. And so what's trying to be protected against is the notion that you're gonna get in your car one day and you're gonna try to turn it on and a QR code is gonna pop up on the IVI that says, you need to scan this with your phone to send us some Bitcoin and we'll let you have your car back. That would suck. <laughs> that would be a very newsworthy situation for those poor folks. Um, so these things about the, the, everything's on the table as far as crazy uh, scenario. No scenario is crazy. I'll say that. So thank you. Um, any, uh, anything else before I throw out a couple of questions? Please jump in. Please feel very welcome to jump in. Go ahead, okay. Bruce. Go ahead, Bruce. Yeah, go All ahead. Right. Your questions. So I'm gonna I'm gonna have some sort of prompting questions and, and someone can jump in if they think uh, they've got a response. Do we have enough namespaces? Are there ever enough namespaces? Will it ever stop? Um, do we have enough C group controllers? Um, I I won't get too much into the way the hierarchies are in the lead versus node system is changed. That's sort of a schematic choice versus a capability choice. Um, but there, there, there's a wide set of controllers now. Um, if people know of things on the horizon, more things than what we just heard about, love somebody to jump in and say, I was thinking about doing this namespace stunt or a new controller of some type, or I have this use case in a different endeavor do you think it would apply to auto? Um, the way the controllers negotiate with the subsystems, is it good? So this gets into granularity. 
uh, for example, on the memory side, it's pretty much a per page granularity, even though the, the files are specified in bytes. That, that sort of makes it easier, easy to the user. So I, as a very high level consumer of this, would, would say, okay, is, is page granularity good enough for me? Does the system, is it every page allocation? It kind of looks that way now. Um, somebody can correct me if that's not the case. Other elements are sort of buckety, where they're periodically measured at, a, at around, I want to say, a microsecond layer level. Um, so if anyone thinks they've experienced problems with the granularity of controllers catching up, um, that would be interesting to hear about. Jump in. Um, C groups V2 is not controlling real-time processes. And so all of them must be in the root C group for a CPU controller to be enabled uh, against them. Um, has anyone found any insufficiency with that so far or had any thoughts or does somebody want to shout about work that they're doing on and when that might happen? Okay. Um, do, does anyone think that the presence of hypervisory elements and, and specifically, I mean, KVM because this is Linux plumbers, um, any of those elements that, that would cause a contention problem? Is there something that collectively I call all these things control services? So the C groups, namespaces. Uh, security mechanisms, set comp, blockage of syscalls, um, er everything. I just call them all control surfaces. And so when I think about hypervisors, has anyone had any scary thoughts about them? You can jump in. Um, and my, my last thing, my last prompt I'll throw out is whether virtualized GPU functions would be sufficiently under control. It's very very easy to imagine that a GPU in a vehicle is segmented where some part of it is trying to detect a pedestrian and the other part is trying to play a SpongeBob video in the backseat for the kids. Um, so there's a temptation to use uh, virtual GPU segmentation um, with, with C groups, et cetera, uh, the, the way they're exposed as devs um, sufficiently deal with that story, or, or at least prompt thought as, as you all work on newer stuff for the kernel. That's all I got. Uh, I'm going to throw it out to the group for any other chat or, or uh, how, how are we on time? All right, we're down to a minute. That worked out kind of well. Um, I, I'll throw it to Gabe for just a second when uh, when he talks about external flow monitor because that makes me think about uh, safety chaperone processes. But Gabe might be thinking of something so, different there. No, no, yeah, well, not the time is up. So the, I mean, the idea is like, is, I mean, do we need to rely on a container if we have uh, an external watchdog that we continue that we regularly pet, right? Because if there is any time interference, anyway it is detected by the watchdog guy. So, but um, mm. and I, I guess the answer is, yeah, anyway, we need to rely on containers at least for the availability of the system. If you don't want to see uh, a very hungry, uh, hungry customer. Okay. And uh, thanks so much everybody uh, for hearing what it, what it's like to be, uh, uh, to channel an automotive developer. I'm grateful for everyone lending their time. So, so sure, uh, I, I need. I will end over to you because I'm. Uh, I mean, I, I need to uh, basically uh, go to. I need to return to the to the other uh, conference. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Gab. Um, hand it off to Brendan. Um, he is controlling the slides for for us. Thank you. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you.
Okay, Brendan and I are um, tag teaming for this presentation to talk about uh, kernel testing frameworks, quick overview. We're not going to talk too much about it. And we also wanted to talk a bit about uh, code coverage. Uh, Rachel uh, touched on that earlier too, so it'll be a complimentary um, presentation in terms of our content. Um, it works well together. Let's see, I'm going to quickly say why K self test, right? We K self test is the regression uh, test suite that we have in the kernel. Um, it is a, uh, it focuses on testing the kernel from user space. So we have uh, shell scripts, C programs, and some of the shell scripts use um, a test kernel test module as needed to ex exercise some of the kernel code paths. And we, this uh, uh, shell script, uh, this uh, test suite, um, breadth and depth coverage. So you might have, a subsystem might have um, several uh, tests and subtests underneath. And then also uh, we have several uh, subsystem tests. It is not for workload or application testing, for sure. And let's see uh, more on this. It's a feature functional and regression testing and perfect for bug fix focused reg regression testing when you find a bug, uh, when it's fixed, you could add a regression for that bug subsystems um, testing as well. So a lot of uh, maintainers and developers when they find a bug um, and they fix it, they do add in some cases uh, a regression test for that. It's perfect for user APIs, system calls, critical user paths, and common use cases. So it is perfect for end-to-end -end regression testing, and it um, it kind of gives a, um, a feel for, well, hey, everything is working, at least uh, some of the error, critical error paths we are testing, and um, any of the success paths we are testing. And I consider this a combination of open and closed box testing. And you can take a look at, for more information, you can take a look at this uh, detailed information. There is a webinar um, that I did a few months ago. Uh, you can uh, check that out. Why K-Unit? I'm going to talk about what Brendan is maintaining for. It's kind of... Uh, so we, the K unit focuses on uh, in kernel testing. It's perfect for testing internal kernel APIs, uh, uh, libraries, drivers, individual units of code, and perfect also for um, being able to uh, test edge cases. And it kind of goes down deeper into some of the edge cases and you can exercise uh, the cases a kernel, some of the kernel code paths that you cannot reach from user space. There's quite a few of them. So it makes it easier for um, leaf nodes and error paths to be tested, and you will be able to go down into those, which is not possible if when you are doing it from the user space. User space um, has, unless you are continuously writing test modules, right, in terms of kernel test, um, okay, at shell scripts and invoking color kernel test modules. So a little bit, let, let's touch on a little bit on McCabe's complexity, it, uh, which is also known as uh, cyclomatic complexity. What it is really is that it, um, it, it is, uh, if you look at the upside down tree, right? And you are calling a, making a system call, so even as, is a uh, system call such as uh, a read call, for example. Uh, it, go, it could go down into propagates through several kernel subsystems, block layer file system, and uh, all of that. And it's really expands into a upside down tree um, with ever expanding branches. So trying to, how do we reach all of these edge cases? Imagine trying to reach arbitrary, arbitrary edge case, for example, uh, that read could go down on. So kernel uh, self-test, for example, will be able to test uh, some of the success paths, but what about the failure cases? What about all the different um, uh, call paths it 
code paths it can go down on. Uh, so that is the complexity and how do we test those? That is, that is one of the complexities. And I do think that the uh, KUnit can, uh, is a practical way um, to be able to, to go down different paths and you can go uh, majority of the edge cases. You, nothing can probably test it. Um, all of the edge cases, right? Um, so, and a successful, if you were to test a read, um, say I'm going to read, use read system call uh, from the user space, very often you can test the success path very clearly, but not the uh, failure, all of the failure cases. So at this point, I'm going to uh, give, give the talking stick to Brendan so he can, I'll speak to the next few slides. Awesome. Uh, thanks, Shua. Um, it looks like you have control over the presentation, so um, you wouldn't mind switching to the next slide. <clears throat> um, all right. So, uh, some of what, uh, like Shua mentioned, uh, Rachel already covered a lot of stuff about coverage. So, some of what I mentioned, I'm going to try to avoid repeating points. Um, but uh, nevertheless, uh, Rachel already gave a pretty good description of what uh, GCOV is, but um, I, I don't think she showed any examples of what the GCOV report looks like for an individual file. Um, so if you look here, the blue line, th this is an example that I, I uh, snipped from a file um, that uh, had GCOV co coverage run on it. And you can see blue co blue lines um, are lines that were executed. Red lines are lines that were not executed. Um, <clears throat> and white lines are lines that there's basically no real execution, like declaring a variable. There, there isn't any you know anything to actually do there. In some cases, uh, one line script was split across multiple lines. So um, I'll get a more concrete example of this later. Uh, next slide, please. All right. So uh, Rachel did mention um, this, so I'm just going to briefly uh, remind everyone. Um, next slide. Uh, so this is uh, is where you. See, so this is basically like this whole page is basically a, um, the coverage for a directory in the kernel, and down here are uh, coverage for individual files and subdirectories. Um, and the next slide. And then here is the coverage for the entire directory. And if you're at the root level, then this would be the coverage for the entire kernel. Uh, next slide. Oh, uh, I think the slides that I skipped um, when we were putting the, this together, uh, Shua, were uh, uh, ended up being uploaded as part of the PDF. So I think there might be a couple slides to skip here. Um, you can skip this one. Yeah, you can skip this one. You can skip this one. Okay, um, there we go. And it looks like it readjusts my arrows. But anyway, so uh, here here's an example of I actually pulled this out of a an actual uh, KUnit test. Um, so there's a, there's a test case that that covers this particular uh, particular function, uh, dev pm qos add request. Uh, it's actually wrapped in another function, but but it's basically just handling locking and stuff. So I'm showing the, the interesting one. Um, so this this uh, this function's already covered by by a K unit test. Um, but you can see uh, these edge cases here, um, the dev PM QoS min frequency and max frequency are not covered by that test case. So um, because we already have a, a test case that covers this function, uh, trying to cover these lines would be um, pretty trivial. All you'd have to do is basically copy the the setup logic in those test cases, and then create another test case which goes over these edge cases. Um, and really, all this boils down to is just um, the uh, a different input type into this function. Um, so the the fact that you're able to call this function directly from KUnit. Um, using in kernel APIs and the, uh, combining that with coverage reports is is really really powerful. Uh, next slide. All right, so um, 
uh, please don't miss. Please don't construe anything that I'm about to say as like a uh, counter to anything that Rachel said in her talk, or anything that was a counter to anything that was in that discussion earlier today. Um, I, I put this talk together before that discussion, so I, I didn't even know there was going to be another talk on coverage. So um, uh, I, I talked a little bit about what coverage is. Um, so I'm gonna I want to share some some con uh, <laughs> uh, I'm gonna share uh, some some of my thoughts on what coverage is not. Um, coverage is not a panacea. It, it is a very, very powerful tool and it's extremely useful and I would strongly encourage people to use it more. Um, I think kind of like what I was saying earlier today, I think it would be great if we could make it available for uh, on, on every patch set, if, it, it, if we could link a coverage report, that would be awesome. Um, but I, I, it, it also doesn't automatically fix your, your testing problems. Like it doesn't, it doesn't even tell you whether your testing is good or bad. Like, yeah, if you drill down into an individual report, it's going to give you a very strong sense of whether you've covered everything in your testing. But even if you have a really high coverage number, it, it doesn't necessarily show all the combinations to how you got to those, those leaf nodes that you have mentioned. So, um, and, and the flip side of it is there are things for which coverage, providing coverage for is not, not necessarily useful. Like I mentioned, I, I don't know how common this example would be in the kernel, but I worked on a team at one point that was able to achieve in this one code base ridiculously high coverage, like it was almost 100%, but they had, uh, they had tests that tested like generated code that was like generated by like, um, this thing that generated like REST API like code and, and it, it was like they weren't useful things because like the the you know the the people we used that uh, code generation for had already like super well tested their code so it was just testing a particular instance of like the code that they generated um, so my, my point here is I don't think that there's a right coverage number um, I, I think that it, it can be useful to give you an idea of what the relative coverage is, and maybe this deserves a little bit more attention. But I don't, I don't think that looking at a coverage number is going to automatically tell you one way or another that, that the coverage here is good. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and the, the other thing is there's a lot of different ways to measure coverage, like um, you know, GCOV immediately shows you that there's, there's line coverage, there's uh, function coverage. I don't know if they show branch coverage, um, but those are all different useful things to look at. Um, but uh, another thing that I'd like to bring to people's attention is the distinction between absolute coverage and incremental. Next slide. So absolute coverage, I, I think up till now is mostly about what we've discussing. It's pretty much what you expect. Uh, it's just the coverage of you know any given set of tests across the entire code base at a given point in time. Um, incremental coverage, I think, is something that is I've not seen talked about much in the Linux kernel community, but I, I find it to be, especially when you're trying to establish that initial test coverage, it, it can be a lot more useful. Uh, it, it focuses on the coverage in the delta of a change. So it's it's tied to a particular change set or a particular kernel patch as opposed to the entire code base. Uh, next slide, please. So um, because of that, because you're only showing the coverage on changed lines that has, Incremental coverage and absolute coverage are different things, but I think where we're at right now, that has some certain um, benefits. Um, incre incremental coverage, first off, it it's a lot easier to achieve a respectable level of coverage uh, earlier on when you have a code base with relatively low coverage. And don't get me wrong, like until you kind of have some of those some test cases to like some tests to build off of and you know, it's a lot easier to test a subsystem when there's already some things in that subsystem which are tested and you know you're working from zero it's always going to be hard 
But once you've kind of established a sort of baseline, even if it's very, very low, it becomes much easier to achieve a high uh, incremental coverage because you only need to, to fo in order to get high incremental coverage, you only need to cover the code that's actually changing. Um, and that helps prioritize code, which is likely to be buggy. Like, you know, bugs are gonna be introduced by new changes. Um, there may be bugs that already exist, but you know, those are more likely to get shaken out over time. So you really wanna focus on the new code. Um, and also, uh, in addition to that, uh, incremental coverage is usually more actionable by developers because uh, the developer can, you know, you, you can't really, of course, there's always going to be people who are like, oh, there's a problem here. I need to change some part of the kernel, but it's a lot easier to motivate somebody to change something when you can point out something wrong in their change. Um, and incremental coverage makes that easier because you're only focused on what they're changing. Um, next slide, please. Now, I've, I'm not saying that absolute coverage is not important. Like, I, I think it is a true statement to say that old code is less likely to contain bugs, but I think it's also a true statement to say that the bugs that it contains are often probably worse. If they've been around long, a long time, they're uh, at a greater risk of being a security concern. Um, and it's also going, in some cases, that unintended behavior can become somewhat intended behavior. And I'm sure everyone here has some, who, who's, who's has a lot of experience developing code will probably have some interesting stories about code that had kind of intended, weirdly unintended behavior. Um, and of course, it's also way easier to compute and it's also really useful for comparing the, the health of subsystems. Uh, next slide, please. I think this is my last slide. Oh, I think. Uh, oh, okay. I was going to cover this one. Um, so thank you, Brennan. So K self test. Um, both of these um, have their advantages. Uh, talking to Brennan's the point about uh, code coverage. I think you could combine the two um, to be able to achieve whatever the ma code coverage we can achieve. Um, if you are uh, doing a depth test in covering deeper code paths, you can do that with KSL test to some extent. Um, it is any of these test frameworks really are as good as the test itself. The test plan, the test needs to be, um, whoever is writing the test, have to think about the paths they are going to test. It's like a musical instrument. It's only good, as good as the uh, person playing it. So these frameworks are in place to be able to uh, give you the, uh, like for example, easier to pass it to zeroing and on a cardinal specific area using K, K unit. And you could exercise several flags in a system call using K self test, but all of this is, um, it just depends on how good the test is. So now I wanna also, uh, there is two webinars. Brandon did a webinar um, uh, a while back, um, and I did a webinar on KSL test. Please check those out. They're on uh, uh, on the earlier slide. Slide seven has a link to K unit webinar. All right. So I want to open it up. We want to open it up for questions now. To say uh, code coverage important for safety. Um, what is the importance, and then also what is uh, a good number for uh, code coverage, and what can what kind of improvements can we make? to the framework itself. And then also, like I said, tests are more important. Framework is there for tests to be written and more tests for regression, more tests for coverage and anything else. Questions, comments? Yes. David is talking about a uh, testing overview page in the kernel docs, which covers the differences between K unit and K self tests and when to use what. Oh, that, that's a really good point by uh, Moto. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. Developers should own tests, not like test engineers. I mean, 
test engineers are you know good and valuable can can help inform like good tests and testing procedure but um good testing is also informed by developers so that is one of the reasons we are keeping k self test and k unit in the kernel so that we can developers can write tests um, when they make a kernel change and also when they write a new api new feature and so on so that is one of the big reasons why we are keeping this in the kernel tree that, yeah that's a that's a really good point um i i i i, I actually uh, came from the background of i i started working on kunit when i was uh uh working on a driver actually it was a couple drivers but i was working on a on a driver and i just found it really frustrating to like why why are all the the tests separate um and uh you know when it came to testing a uh, particular like um error paths and stuff it was just like it was very very difficult to do and um you know it was something that was pretty easy to do in in other code bases that had had you know some things like like uh K unit and stuff so yeah having having the test live with the code is i i, I you know th i think that there's a lot of test code bases out there for the kernel which are obviously really good um but I think having options for developers to be able to have um, tests live with their code is, is critical. So Rachel, yes, you have a good point that writing tests should be shared. And it, it is, that's how it is, right? The kernel developers will write a test and that is anybody can go and update the test and make it better. So we always welcome uh, patches that make our tests better. So I do know that I do say this that um, as a developer and um, I also write uh, tests. Um, I have done it forever uh, during my career. Um, I sometimes it's like you cannot find um, uh, the mistakes. You cannot be editor of your own um, blog or something. So that's where uh, Rachel's point comes in. That um, test. Uh, that's where the closed and open box testing comes in, of course uh published uh published code coverage results for kuna um i don't think we've published them i mean hypothetically that okay um i do have i could try to find some because I, I actually have a coverage report open on my computer somewhere that has i think there it. are some really old ones somewhere published but, uh, yeah, awesome. yeah, I think you're right, David. Um, but let me see if I can. I'm not sure what the easiest way to share this is because it's actually like on this coverage reports like on my my personal machine. I guess I could probably just share a picture of it, or I could just tell you what it is, and you can take my word for it. We could give you a presenter, and you could share your screen if you want. Oh, uh, yeah, I could do that. Um, yeah, I'll do that. Your presenter now. Okay. Um, all right. So here's the coverage report I generated just the other day. Um, if you look at libs.kunit, we're at 75.8% coverage by line coverage, and by function, we're 77.4. Um, that's where most of the logic lives, um, but we also we do have some stuff in include slash kunit, and apparently that's hundred percent. So, oh wait, no, sorry, we're we're eighty seven percent. Okay, I was looking at lib slash math. So, um, I don't know. Is that um, you know I. So I, 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 we, we try to practice what we preach, you know, try to. Um, yeah, uh, I guess this, this, these are going to be uploaded as videos. So I guess we've published it now, but we should probably do a better job of like actually publishing the, uh, the data over time. We have, um, presentation yesterday, I uh, 
showed some graphs of uh, candidates growth and that that's based on a spreadsheet that we've been using for tra tracking candidate growth internally. Um, we, we were planning on uploading that spreadsheet to the uh, knit.dev website. Um, and one of the thing, one of the columns there is the coverage per release, but we only have it for the last two releases for reasons. Obviously also, if you're looking for like coverage over the whole kernel, that's not really a perfectly well-defined thing because you can't run all of the k-unit tests on any given kernel because some of them are testing features that are ac actively in conflict with each other yeah. so you get coverage results for a given configuration um and i think these ones would be presumably just the default uml configuration but uh... um so AJT or AJD um, asked how many tests, a okay, candidate tests are in the tree right now. Um, there are about 300. So in um, 514, I believe there was 297, 298, somewhere around there. And in um, five, uh, 5.15 RC2, um, I believe there was 308. I remember correctly. It's 281 for 514 and 309 oh. for RC2 at 515. Uh, okay. And that's the number of test cases, not um, suites or, or files, but uh, individual test cases. Yeah. So I have a question. So the, uh, when you're talking about David, you're talking about UML. Um, what is level of, what level of confidence can some, somebody in a ARM architecture for say x86, have when they run these tests um, on UML. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't think I understand the question. Um, so the level of confidence of running these tests, um, obviously a generic code, uh, you're good with that. But um, hmm. uh, what would running all these tests on UML give the same level of confidence to a maintainer or a developer that's working on a specific architecture. I, th so, I think it, you can go ahead. Yeah. It, it depends a little bit on what you're, you're trying to test. If you're trying to test architecture specific stuff, you're always going to be more confident it's going to work on that architecture if you've tested it on that architecture. And that's why it is possible to run K unit tests on whatever architecture you like. Um, if you're testing some totally generic function that you don't think has much architecture specific stuff in it, the difference between testing it on UML where it's going to run really quickly um, and testing it, you know, on any given architecture, um, you know, the, the trade-off there may be a lot better. Yeah, just run it on UML. It's a lot quicker, you know, a test that runs quickly enough that you run it is better than a test that runs slowly enough that, um, you know, you don't run it at all. But right. You can run the test on any architecture. Right. Yeah. Uh, so, I, oh, so Mark has uh, a question. Has there been much activity on moving KSL plus to KTAP output? I recently converted some myself. Um, not that I know of. Um, I keep uh, doing that when I get it, uh, time, um, as I term time permits, but I haven't, I, not that I know of, Mark. Go ahead, Brendan. Um, I, I was going to say something else, but yeah, um, yeah, I think uh, our, we, we had an intern, Ray, who submitted um, uh, for finally formalizing some of the, the KTAP stuff. So um, I think what the follow-up revision that she wrote, which we haven't posted to the list yet, unfortunately, but um, it, it looks a lot more like what um, KSelfTest is already doing. So I think KSelfTest is probably like mostly there. Um, m most of the tests we looked at anyway. Um, but of course, you know, it's, People need to actually agree on what what's going to be in the KTAP spec. So, um, but yeah, I, I I think that um, 
I think they're we're we're pretty close to having that that done. So um our time is up, Brennan. Yep. Okay. Uh, thank you, Brennan. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Trying to find my last slide. Okay, so thanks everybody for uh, joining. Um, and this, oh, I can't control the slides, looks like. So I wanted to. Um, Should be able to now. Okay. Um, wanted to leave you with uh, um, that we are, uh, we have uh, continuing this conversation in the upcoming ELISA um, workshop. And I will put the link in the uh, chat here and then please join us for that workshop as well. It's upcoming in November. Thank you. Kate, do you have, uh, do you want to say anything? No, I was just trying to find the slide you were looking for. Yeah, you. I could, I thought I uploaded it to BBB. I can't find it myself. Okay. So that, just, yeah, I uploaded all chapter. of this. <laughs> right. Okay. All good. Bruce, do you have a question? Yes, it was a figure out on me. Sorry. Um, I see there's a recording. Are you guys going to make that available or chop it up into the pieces? Um, also wanted to send lots of thanks for, for setting this up. Thank you. Kate, are you going to answer that? Uh, uh, since it's a mini conf, I figured you might know more than me. Oh, but oh yes, yes. <laughs> so, no, basically, it's already being recorded. So uh, right now, the live one big blob is available. But your next question is, is it going to be broken up? I believe that's why we hired the uh, E3 team. Then there should be, that's why if you notice one of the uh, 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 E3 webcasting is watching this because they're recording this. And it should be all broken up by... Um, so you could jump right to the topics. I believe that's just what we're doing. That's what my understanding too. So yes, it will we be just available. Don't, we, don't have, we don't have timelines quite yet for that. Yeah, it'd be really great to pick up on the, the sessions that I missed. Uh, there was lots of interesting stuff. Thank you. And if you um, go to watch live on, if you go to you know, lakesplumbersconf.org and go find the watch live that has all these being live streamed right now, the ones that were live streamed yesterday or and this one probably in a few hours will be available to watch. It's just that it's going to be a lot, you have to kind of fast forward to find the location. I've already looked at a few, uh, watched a few from past days. Cool. Thanks. Okay, I did find the slide. So here is the upcoming Alyssa workshop uh, in uh, running from number eight to trend submit talks. Uh, we can continue the conversation, some of the uh, code coverage and uh, other things we have discussed today. Thank you.